chair has determined that this meeting was properly posted. As there is no quorum requirement for the annual Springtown meeting, and the town clerk is present to make record of the proceedings, the chair calls to order the 2019 Springtown meeting at 7 p.m. This meeting is being broadcast live on the Groton Channel. It is also being videotaped for rebroadcast and posting on the internet. In addition, it is being audio taped for record keeping purposes. If you are so inclined, may I see by a show of hands how many voters are here at their first town meeting? Welcome. My name is Jason Kelpie and I am the town moderator. The role of the moderator is to preside at town meeting and regulate the proceedings, decide all questions of order, and make public declaration of all votes. One of the moderator's functions is to help voters understand the rules of the meeting and try to make the meeting as efficient as possible. If at any time you are uncertain of what is happening, please speak up and let me know. The parliamentary phrase is point of order, but simply saying help or I don't understand is fine. When I recognize you, you should then go to a microphone and ask your question. There are a few things that you can do to help the chair. Be sure that you have your voter card. This meeting's card is salmon. Do not lose it. If the chair is uncertain on a voice vote, we may vote by raising the card. If we need to count votes, only voters with a card will be counted. Be sure to have an informational packet, a warrant, and other materials that were available out in the hallway. This packet contains the, mo the main motions to be made tonight and is an important reference tool. Please take this time to silence your electronic devices. Voters may sit in any available seat except the last two rows. The last two rows are reserved for guests and non-voters who are asked to remain quiet during debate and silent during voting. A voter who wishes to address the meeting may proceed to the nearest microphone and wait to be called on by the chair. While it is not a legal requirement, you may give your name and address. For those voters who wish to address the meeting but would like to use a wireless microphone, Mrs. Collette has a wireless microphone. She is to my right in the middle section. She get her attention and she will come to you and then get my attention to recognize you to speak. Please be sure your remarks pertain to the subject matter in motion on the floor. Please direct all comments and questions to the moderator and avoid the temptation to engage others in a dialogue or a question and answer session. If you ask a question, the chair will, solicit, will attempt to solicit an answer from the appropriate person. <clears throat> Page two in your warrant is a notice of the upcoming town election. Town elections will be held May 21st, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m with precincts two and three voting at the country club and precinct one voting at town hall. A candidate's night will be held Tuesday, May 14th at 7.30 p.m. here in the Performing Arts Center. All candidates are invited to participate and the public is invited to ask questions. The event is sponsored by the Groton Democratic Town Committee and moderated by Mr. Robert Goslin. The warrant has 36 articles. 10 have been included in a, cons in a consent agenda, which will be the last item of business. Please take time to review the motions contained in the consent agenda. If you wish to debate any of those motions, you will have the opportunity to remove them from the consent agenda. The chair anticipates needing two sessions of town meeting to complete the business. At or about 10 p.m. tonight, the chair will entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting to a time certain. 
This hall is reserved for a second session of town meeting next Monday, May 6th, as is the usual tradition. Please join me in a moment of silence as we remember those Grotonians we have lost since we last convened. Thank you. <clears throat> to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please welcome students from our middle school. These students are members of the Bilge Busters and Team U Nu Nu Ni Um, <laughs> two Destination Imagine teams from Groton Dunstable who advance to participate in the Global Finals Tournament in Kansas City next month. There they will compete against teams from across the United States and more than 15 other countries. Destination Imagination program is a fun hands-on system of learning that fosters student creativity, courage, and curiosity through open-ended academic challenges in the fields of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, fine arts, and service learning. The participants learn patience, flexibility, persistence, ethics, respect for others and their ideas, and the collaborative problem-solving process. If you are interested in learning more, their table is in the hallway. Students, if you please. Please rise. Thank you, students, and good luck in Kansas City. Would Mr. Stuart Schulman please come forward? Section 2.2 of the town charter requires the appointment of a deputy moderator to serve in the absence of the moderator. The chair would seek the consent of the meeting to appoint Stuart Schulman as deputy moderator for the term of one year. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. Mr. Unanimous, Mr. Shulman is appointed by unanimous vote. Mr. Shulman, you need to be sworn in. No speeches. No speeches. Thank you, Mr. Shulman. The chair will recognize voter Michelle Collette for the purpose of making a motion. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I move that debate during this town meeting be limited to three minutes for each speaker with the exception of the main proponent and opponent of each article and at the discretion of the moderator. There's been a motion to limit debate to three minutes. Is there a second? The motion to limit debate has been made and seconded. A motion to limit debate is itself not debatable. It requires a two-thirds majority because it restricts free speech. The motion again is I move that debate during this town meeting be limited to three minutes for each speaker with the exception of the main proponent and opponent of each article and at the discretion of the moderator. A yes vote limits the three minutes at the microphone. Limits a voter to three minutes at the microphone. A no vote means there will be no time restriction requires a two-thirds majority. All those in favor of the motion to limit debate signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes have it by a two-thirds majority. The motion to limit debate passes. Mr. Cataldo is our timekeeper down front. He will raise the yellow flag at, say, two minutes, and then the red flag at the three minutes when that is over. The primary proponent and primary opponent on any main motion has been granted seven minutes in advance by the moderator. The chair will accept a motion to waive the reading of the warrants. It has been moved and seconded to waive the, or has moved and seconded to waive the reading of the warrant. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. 
Those opposed? The ayes have it. The reading of the warrant has been waived. Article one, Mrs. Pine. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the town's 2018 annual report be accepted and placed in the permanent records of the town. Article one has been moved and seconded, Mrs. Pine. Yes, so uh, this is the town's annual report with a lovely picture of a fireman at the fireworks last July. Uh, it was available on your way in. Before we vote on this article, I want to point out that at the beginning of the town report, there's a very long list of all of your elected and appointed officials. The vast majority, like about 90% of these people, serve as volunteers. Between people volunteering in town government and people volunteering in Groton's many, many non-government organizations, our community life is incredibly enriched, and we are so lucky to be the beneficiaries of this generosity of time and effort. So would you please join me in a round of applause to express our deep gratitude to all volunteers. And just a reminder, our government depends heavily on volunteers. So whether you are new in town or you've been here forever, we invite you to get involved. There is a form on the last page of the warrant that you could fill out or you could speak to any of us up here about your interests. We would love to have you. Um, I, we do encourage you to read the town report. We're not gonna read it here, obviously. But it details all of the work done by our dedicated paid employees. They are the ones who make our town government run effectively and efficiently. So please join me in another round of applause for our paid employees. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments on Article 1? Requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Article 1 passes by a unanimous vote. Article 2, Mr. Geiger. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move the following compensation be set for the following elected officials for the ensuing year. Town Clerk, $88,430. Town Moderator, $65 for the ensuing year. Article two has been moved and seconded, Mr. Geiger. It requires a majority vote to pass this article. Uh, the select board recommended approval unanimously the Finance Committee did not take a position on this article. The purpose of this article is to provide compensation for elected officials as proposed by the town manager. Are there any questions or comments on Article 2? Requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The ayes have it. Article 2 passes by a unanimous vote. Article three, Mr. Deegan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, everyone. I move that the town of Groton wage and classification schedule be amended and adopted for fiscal year 2020 as printed in Appendix B of the warrant for the 2019 Spring Town Meeting. Article three has been moved and seconded, Mr. Deegan. We have three employees in town that are not under contract or part of collective bargaining units on the municipal side. Uh, one is in the HR department, the other's in the IT, and the third is the executive assistant to the town manager. Uh, those three employees are part of this uh, motion and part of this article. Uh, the department heads union in town received a 2% pay increase for FY 2020, and if you approve this uh, motion and this warrant article, they would receive the same 2% cost of living adjustment. Are there questions or comments on Article 3? Requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? 
Article three passes by unanimous vote. Article four. Article four is the budget. We will debate and vote on the budget in a series of 15 separate main motions. Mr. Green of the Finance Committee will give a presentation on the entire budget when the first motion is on the floor. Because Mr. Green will be presenting a multi-million dollar budget, the chair has allotted him additional time beyond seven minutes. Voters will be asked to hold questions and comments on the budget until we reach the appropriate motion and section of the budget. Motion one, general government, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that $2,086,103 be hereby appropriated for general government as represented by lines 1,000 through 1,182 in Appendix A of the warrant. Each line item to be considered as a separate appropriation for the purposes voted. And to meet this appropriation, the sum of $15,126 be transferred from the excess and deficiency fund, free cash, and the sum of $2,070,977 be raised from the fiscal year 2020 tax levy and other general revenues of the town. Article four, motion one has been moved and seconded. Mr. Green. Thank you. So uh, once again, I'd just like to sort of walk you through uh, how we got to where we are. We can go to the next slide. Thank you, Don. Uh, so the budget process, talk about some of the goals and guidance that we provided to the town manager and the finance team. I'll go through expenditures and what we found there, reven the revenue side of the ledger. Talk about uh, what the drivers are of our budget. Talk about the tax rate calculation and how it'll impact all of our tax bills. And then finally uh, end up with a five-year forecast. So this is the budget timeline. We started back in October of last year. Uh, we met to provide guidance to the town manager uh, and his finance team around what we wanted to see happen with this year's budget. Uh, in November, the town manager began meeting with his department heads. As required by town charter, the town manager needs to provide a balanced budget to the finance committee by the end of the year. He did so on December 21st which really, really kicks off the beginning of the budget seasons. We, on January 7th, he met with both the, the uh, select board as well as the, the finance committee to present the budget, at which point we, we had a series of meetings. What you'll discover is this year was, was a pretty typical year. In fact, the dates almost lined up with the same dates that we had last year. We had one more meeting this year than we did last year. All of it lands with us being here at town meeting where the finance committee is presenting this budget to you, where you as the voters of town meeting are the ultimate deciders as to what we spend in town. So when we meet with the town manager and, uh, and his finance team and give him budgetary guidance, there's a long list of things that he has to follow uh, based upon our, our town written policies that are adopted by both the select board and the finance committee. This is a list of things. These are not specific things that we gave him this year. These are things that are ongoing, again, based upon those policies. Um, the only one I would sort of point out where there was sort of a slight change in how we're doing things is under operating budget goals, there's a goal to fund OPEB trust fund with an amount equal to current liabilities and begin to pay down future liabilities. OPEB is uh, basically a liability the town has for paying out future benefits to retirees in town. Uh, and we have no problem paying those benefits. Uh, we are not actually required by law at this point to pay down our future liability. Uh, however, when we go out to bond, the, the uh, banks that we would be lending from frequently look at our credit rating and our credit rating can be impacted by whether we are being prudent and saving uh, money against this future liability. And so in the past year, We've actually updated our policies to state that we're going to start funding the OPEB trust fund so that our liability doesn't grow, that it maintains the same or continues to go down. And in fact, uh, in the written policies, we now have a plan in place uh, that over the next, the next you know, 10, 20 years that we will, continue, we will start to pay down that liability uh, and, and so that that won't be sitting on top of uh, us as a potential future liability. 
The specific guidance that we provided to the town manager and his finance team included the following four items. This is specific for this year's, this year's budget season. The first was we asked him that the entire municipal budget, excluding um, excluded debt, shall be no greater than 2.54% in growth. This was based upon some of the work we've been doing over the last several years, which indicates the maximum growth rate that, is, uh, that, that, that we can afford between what we need to spend both on the municipal side as well as for our two school districts. The second piece of guidance that we gave to him is that he shall submit a balanced budget without the need of an override, uh, a prop two and a half override. So uh, again, he needed to work with the school districts, work within the 2.54%, but the operating assumption was we would, we would not be supporting a prop two and a half override this year. Uh, it's not that we thought we would need one this year, it's just we wanted to make explicit that we didn't support one this year. Number three under the guidelines, with the possible exception of fully funding two new firefighter positions in 2020, there shall be no new benefited positions proposed. So this is a key piece of guidance for the town manager. It lets him know, you know, are we looking to add services where we, we think we may be underserviced? Are we looking to decrease? Uh, in this particular instance, in general, what we said is we think we would like to maintain service. However, at the time we provided this, this budget guidance, there was already discussion underway about the possibility of adding two new firefighter positions. And I'll talk about that in a little more depth in a few slides. The fourth piece of budget guidance was that the town manager shall track changes in revenue projections limited to three times per year and provide revised estimates on December 31st, March 31st, and October 31st. So as we go through the budget season, we update uh, our revenue estimates, and our revenues come from a number of, of areas, things like local receipts, um, but as well as uh, state matching funds and, and other areas. And so we specifically asked him to provide official <laughs> updates to his revenue projections on those three dates. So uh, as I said, on December 21st, as per required by charter, he provided us his proposed budget. It included uh, a municipal operating budget proposal of, of $14,796,000. That was an increase of $280,433 or 1.93%. So as, as you could see from the previous page, it was well within the guidance that we had provided to him. The budget that the Finance Committee has adopted and are bringing to you tonight um, is a total of $14,842,905, or an increase of $326,638, or a 2.25% increase. And again, that is well within uh, the limits that, that we, had, we had started the budget season with a target as. Uh, the things to note, some of the main drivers uh, of, of the changes, one is, in fact, we, we, we have added two additional firefighters to the budget. Um, I would also note that when you look at the $14 million, that is not the total budget for the town. It does not include the schools and it does not include um, certain debt obligations. So this slide comes, if you, uh, if you open up the, the warrant, in the very back of the warrant, you can see this slide if you want to look in more detail. But this effectively is, our, is the budget that was contained in the budget message, and what you can see is this is divided by different categories. Those categories are, uh, for the most part, the, the motions that you're going to hear tonight. And what you will see is for general government, it's growing at 2.8%. Land use, 4.16%, which although that sounds a little high, it's that, that, that particular category is a small number, so, so small changes to that number cause a big percentage change to the budget. Protections of persons and property grew by 5.56%. Again, we've chosen to add two new firefighter positions there. DPW remains at 2%, and library and citizen services at 0.98% growth. The, uh, the other thing that uh, big areas you'll see is Neshoba Tech um, growing at 30%. It has to do uh, particularly with enrollment. We've seen increased enrollment at Neshoba Tech by Groton students, and you can see the Groton the Groton Dunstable Regional District's operating budget growing at 5.19%, and you'll, you'll be hearing more about that as well. On this slide, it's very similar to the last slide, but the Finance Committee likes, likes to break things down, not just by category, but by what we call the big three. Um, municipal wages is one of the biggest categories of the entire budget, so we want to look at what municipal wages are growing at. For this year, it's growing at 4.69%. The second one is employee benefits, is a very big number. 
Um, in this particular case, it's actually decreased, and this has more to do with, with um, the number of employee benefits and some other items, that, and, and not so much. It's not like, like uh, the insurance that we're providing to our employees that our insurers came back and decreased uh, our, our charges. And then the third one is expenses, right? So wages, benefits, and expenses. And what you can see is we are tightly controlling expenses with expense growth of only 0.26%. So what are the main budget drivers? First, as I said, wages and benefits. We are in the second year of a three-year collective bargaining agreement with the seven units that are in town. Those collective bargaining agreements include things like cost of living increases on a yearly basis and other things. That is a main driver of the increase of our wages line, right? The things that we are in legal agreements that we have to provide as increases. The second line, um, we are also starting to move incentive pay to one-time payments from base salary increases. So uh, in, in previous cycles of agreements with our unions, uh, we had moved from you know, a more traditional steps and lanes type increases where the longer you work for the town, the, the more money you made, and went more towards a job classification and incentive pay uh, program where uh, depending upon your job classification, that set your salary, and then uh, at, based upon how you performed, we would give you an incentive, uh, incentive pay increase. We're moving from taking those incentive pay increases and making it part of your base salary, which means that every year it sort of accumulates on top of each other, and we're moving it to a, a one-time incentive payment uh, so that it doesn't increase the base salary and therefore allows us to control growth of the, set, the wage line. And then the last thing was a one-time savings related to paying off a pension benefit liability. Um, we've had a, a pension benefit liability that we've been paying since the 90s for uh, an early retirement program we had. Uh, we paid that off last year, so this year that line decreased. This was a, a actually for this year, is a really big benefit for us. It allowed us more easily to come up with a budget that balanced. However, next year it doesn't help us, right? Because next year we don't get the benefit of, of, of this, this retiring liability. The second budget driver is around debt service. One of the things we've done is working in close concert with the, the finance team is we've worked to stabilize the in levy debt service. So there are two types of debt. One is debt that we pay out of our normal taxes. That's in levy. And the other is excluded debt. That is where we actually go to the ballot box and we vote to exclude the debt from being within the Prop 2.5 levy. Uh, we've been moving to stabilize the in-levy debt service so that it doesn't fluctuate as much year to year. And we've been doing that using excess and deficiency funds, sometimes known as free cash, to pay down short-term notes so that we can have a, a stable. We, we try to have about uh, $250,000 in debt service payments within, within the levy. Secondly, uh, one of the big impacts to our debt service this year is we are now paying the first full year of debt service for the new senior center project. Uh, although it's not complete, we are, we are beginning to pay the full debt service on that. Uh, last year when we voted, we v went to the ballot box, we voted to exclude that, so that is debt that is outside the levy limit. And then the last thing to be aware of is there are two proposals that you're going to see tonight. One is around the library roof, and the second is around updating our DPW uh, facilities. And assuming they pass here and at the ballot box, those will also add to excluded debt, which will obviously impact our, our tax bill. The third area around budget drivers is the school district assessments. Uh, and this has to do with, with a few different areas. but. Um, one of the most, uh, the biggest areas that has driven so much conversation over the past several years, and uh, unless something changes, we will continue to talk a lot about, is insufficient state matching funds growth. So uh, particularly for the Groton Dunstable Regional School District, a large percentage of their funding comes from state matching funds. The state has determined that uh, the amount of funds they give us is more than sufficient, and so from year to year, uh, the amount of growth in those matching funds is, has, has been stagnant for the most part. And as a result, if, if a large amount of money that we need is not growing uh, year to year, then the towns of Dunstable and Groton have to make up that difference. 
So as a result of that, one of the things that we see is that even if the, the district grows their operating budget by 3.5%, the assessment to the town of Groton and how much we have to pay goes up by 5%. It's not the fault of the district. It's not the fault of the town. It's just the fact that the uh, state matching funds are not increasing at the same rate that the expenses are increasing. The other thing that happened this year in particular is there are some unanticipated expenses relating to state mandated programs and out of district enrollments. And then finally, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, this year there was a one-time use of the, the district's excess and deficiency fund, again sometimes known as free cash, to offset the FY 2020 operating budget. And that had a significant impact on how the budget looks this year. So uh, there is frequently conversation about free cash. And, and I, I think I, I say every year, free cash is not free. All free cash is, is at the end of the budget year, if there are monies that were collected and were budgeted but were not spent, those monies fall to what's called an excess and deficiency fund, otherwise known as free cash. Once the, those monies are certified by the state, uh, both the, the town has an excess deficiency fund as well as the districts. Both of us can spend that money once it's been uh, certified by the state. The town of Groton, again, we have written and approved financial policies approved by both the select board and the finance committee. And one of the policies that are, is, is contained in the written document is that ongoing operating costs will be funded by ongoing operating revenue sources to protect the town from fluctuating service levels and avoid concern with one-time revenues, uh, excuse me, and avoids concern when one-time revenues are reduced or removed. So what does this mean? So again, free cash is generated on a yearly basis when you either have revenues you didn't anticipate or you don't spend as much money as you anticipated. In general, it is not something that you want to rely upon because in any given year, that may not happen. So within the town, we have a policy that states that we use free cash, but we use free cash for things that are one-time expenses. So a capital project would be a one-time expense. If we're going to buy uh, a new truck for the DPW department, we're not going to buy that every year. And if we don't buy it this year, we can buy it next year. However, an employee is an operating expense. Every year, you've got to pay the employee. So therefore, we don't want to use a one-time uh, revenue source like free cash in order to fund uh, an employee's salary. So this year, the district decided to use the district's E&D to reduce assessments. Uh, I am not in any way, shape, or form saying that what the district did is wrong. I'm not trying to point fingers. I'm just trying to give you some background here as to what's happening. Um, but they made this choice because the district has needs. And in this particular uh, case, Groton was in a position where we could have funded but Dunstable had expressed concern about their ability to pay the needs of the district for this year. And so the, the school committee decided to use the district E&D in order to offset the assessments for both Groton and Dunstable for this year so that the district could get the funds that they need to operate the district at the level that we all want them to, while not putting either town in the position to have to do an override. The result of that was that the reduction in assessment to to Groton was $308,731. So on the one hand, this is great for this year, right? We have no problem f with the budget this year. We, we are under the levy limit and, and uh, y you know, as I wrote here, it, it seems to make the, the FY 2020 budget easy, even when adding two additional fire department personnel. However, what it does is it, it creates a situation where next year actually becomes more difficult because the district has indicated that they don't intend to use E&D funds to fund the operating expense next year, which means that next year we will have to pay that 308 plus whatever growth they experience next year. And then, uh, so, uh, so that was an area of concern for the finance committee uh, as well as the select board. Uh, I would state that the collaboration between the district and the town of Groton over the last several years has just been outstanding. We continue to collaborate. We've been looking at the growth of both sides, working collaboratively to figure out how to get to a place that is sustainable. Uh, we've now created a new multi-board uh, committee, if you will, that includes the select boards from both towns, the finance committees from both towns, as well as members from the re regional school district 
with the very specific intent of looking at the next five-year forecast and looking at next year and, and, and being as proactive as we can in eliminating future year deficits. Um, I talked about the, the fire department. Uh, I'm not going to get into any level of depth at this point as to why we're hiring uh, firefighters. This is specifically the numbers and how they hit the budget. Uh, the fire wages line item with current staffing would have been $981,602. When you add the two additional fire department personnel, uh, those two firefighters come at a cost of $117,240 specifically for their wages. However, as a result of hiring these two additional personnel, um, we've determined that we can reduce the EMT incentive pay line item. We can also reduce the call firefighter EMT pay item because we will, we, we, they'll be covered by, by full-time um, staff. Um, however, we did need to increase the holiday standby pay by 17800 And so what ends up happening is the new number that you're going to see and vote on tonight for the fire wages with the additional personnel is 1045641 And that's where, if you've been reading or looking or hearing, you hear this number that we're hiring two personnel for 64000 no, that's, we are not hiring two personnel for 64000 It's 117000 But when we looked at the budget and made adjustments based upon what we can make as adjustments, uh, the net difference for this year's budget is 64000 So on a line item by line item basis, I've effectively gone through most of this. The town manager salaries, police expenses, senior center van wages, and health insurance employee expenses were all updated to reflect our current knowledge and, and changes that occurred over the budgeting season. Fire wages were updated to include two additional personnel. Um, the Shilber Tech operating expenses went up because we have higher Groton enrollment numbers. And the Groton Dunsville Regional School District operating expenses were, uh, were, were set to the new number based upon the approved budget and therefore the, uh, the assessment that was provided to us by the district. When you look at revenues, it's pretty standard. Uh, it's two and a half, uh, two and a half percent to our current uh, property tax base. Uh, we are allowed to add new growth. We are estimating 20 million in new growth, and as a result, you do all of the math and you come out the bottom with a, a total revenue source growth of 3.71 percent. And when you go to the next page. With the budget that is proposed tonight, if you as town meeting choose to, uh, to, to uh, approve the budget on an average home of $459,000, you will see the tax bill go up uh, as a result of this budget of $220. And then finally, as always, we always look at the five-year budget because budgets are not uh, something you want to look at at is only a single year you want to look at them over time and uh, this is uh, does not reflect the work of the multi-board that I talked about where the district is going to get together with the two towns so these numbers um, will absolutely be changing over the coming year uh, but what we're seeing is an unfortunately the, the very bottom line is not uh, appearing on the screen uh, but what you see is that in FY20, we are actually under the levy limit by $197,000. In FY21, as I mentioned, as a result of making up the, the E&D as well as the growth in the budget, um, we are currently forecasting that we're around $750,000 uh, in deficit land. So in other words, we either need to uh, find ways to reduce our, reduce our growth rate find ways to make cuts or find additional revenue next year as currently the projections would indicate that, uh, that we're in the hole by 750000 And then what you'll see is in the, year, the, the following three years, 22, 23, 24, all the way actually out to 25, um, what you would see on an annual basis is right now, based upon growth rates, we have a problem of about two hundred and fifty dollars to $300,000 that we need to solve. In general, the picture on the five-year budget has not changed from last year. I think that's important to note because we're standing before you tonight with a budget that's in balance, right, that, that we're not running around with our, our hair on fire. So that may happen again next year. But again, I think it's very important for you to understand that we have challenges and the way we're going to solve these challenges is through hard work and, and collaboration. And again, as I mentioned, that, that work is underway. 
So finally, what I would tell you is, once again, um, this has been a very thorough process. Uh, we believe that the budget that we're presenting to you reflects the needs as well as the priorities of the town of Groton, and the Finance Committee unanimously recommends the adoption of this budget to those assembled here at town meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, the motion on the floor is Motion 1, General Government, which is lines 1,000 through 1,182 in Appendix A of the Warrant. I believe those are pages 44 to 48. Finance Committee has given its reports. Are there questions or comments on Motion 1, General Government? Would you do it? Mr. Deegan for the Selectman. The select board voted three to two in favor of the budget. I was one of the two that voted against approving this budget. And uh, select board member Pine was the other individual that voted against it. She can speak to that if she would like. The reason that I chose to vote against the budget has nothing to do with the fundamentals of constructing it and putting it together. It has nothing to do with the firefighters. It has nothing really to do with anything that's contained within it other than we're facing a fiscal crisis in town. Uh, as you heard uh, Gary Green just say to you, next year we're looking at a three quarter of a million dollar shortfall. And part of the reason that's occurring is, is something that on the face seems like a very good thing. Uh, the school district reduced the assessment to both communities. To Groton, it was a $308,000 reduction by using their E&D in order to meet the needs for our neighboring community of Dunstable to help them through a crisis they were going through uh, financially on. Needless to say, the budget absorbed that $308,000 reduction in the assessment that was passed on to us. And as a result, the picture looks rosy, and as Gary Green again said, well, it seems very easy on the surface that we have uh, almost $200,000 under the levy limit. As far as I'm concerned, it's penny wise and pound foolish, because all we did was spend the savings that we got from the district reduction. And that next year, rather than facing a $300,000 to a $350,000 shortfall, we're gonna be facing, as I said, a projected three quarters of a million dollars. You then compound that and look at the successive four years and we're facing over the next five years a two million dollar shortfall. Uh, when you take that collectively and look at what the impacts will be in terms of the success of a year over year over year override, sooner or later you folks are gonna say no, the voters are gonna say no, and all of a sudden we're gonna be tasked with having to cut uh, municipal jobs, the schools may have to cut jobs, I can't speak for them, but in order to meet the needs by the appropriation that's in place, uh, we're going to find ourselves right in the crosshairs of a crisis, and there's no need for that. Therefore, I was an advocate for an override, even though the picture looked rosy this year in terms of offsetting the, the future year shortfalls and going forward with an override. So if you want to vote in favor of this budget, Go ahead and do so. Beware of what's coming down the pike next year. The motion before you deals with general government. Are there questions or comments on motion one? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, Chris Colton from um, Dunstable. I mean from <laughs> Acorn Path. I'm thinking about what you guys said. Um, very excellent presentation. Uh, I had gone through the report sent to us also, and it raises the question, the town manager said how our wages, et cetera, had been held to a 2% or 1.75% cost of living. Um, and yet, as you said, that's the largest uh, expense. And I see like the town manager's salary, which you had on the top, went up you know, 5.5 .5 or 6%, and a lot of them are well over 4% or whatever. I, I'm just wondering if you could explain the difference since they're saying how 2% and most of them are showing way more than 2%, and that's the largest expense we have in town. 
Town Manager, Mark Haddad. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm, I'm not going to address my salary uh, increase because right. I think it's, that would be self-serving. Um, but as far as the unions and the other, other wages, the cost of living adjustment was 2%. With regards to the department heads, they have an incentive program, and you'll notice in all the motions there's a small transfer out of the excess and deficiency fund of free cash to cover a portion of the budget. Those are one-time increases that will not affect future growth, as, as uh, Chairman Green described earlier. And there are other employees who do get a performance incentive as well that does go to their base. So that's why you see some percentages that are a little bit different than, than, than others. But the cost of living adjustment for the employees were either 2% or 1.75%, depending on the uh, particular union involved. Okay. So we didn't really stay to that lower level. We were much higher on an average, it seems. Mr. Green, Chairman of the Finance Committee. Yeah, I, I would just add that, that sometimes when you look at the budget um, at the top level, it, it can be confusing like that. But what I would say is when you look at that wages line, there are other things in there than just, so you can't say, well, the average uh, cost of living adjustment was 2%, so why isn't it 2%? Because there are other things such as, um, a, right, two firefighters we hired. There's other things such as um, we now have an opt-out for, for uh, town employees who don't want to purchase health insurance. We actually incentivize them not to buy our health insurance, go on their, 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 their um, spouses. So that's a payout that ends up on that line item. So there, there are a few different things that end up on that line item than just purely what you would think of as something that we're paying someone. So yes, all the contracts, we have the seven union contracts plus three employees. We know exactly what the, um, what the, the cost of living average increase is per year. It is, it is in that 2%, that, that 2.5% 2 range. Um, there is also, I, I talked about the, the performance pay incentive that ends up on that line uh, as well. One of the things I didn't talk about is that we've decided uh, at this point as we're moving to one-time payments that we're paying because they're one-time payments and not operating, we're actually using excess and deficiency funds for that so that if we don't have extra money, potentially we don't fund those things. But again, if you look at that line item and it says 4%, you're like, that doesn't make sense because you said, you know, you're, you're, you're giving a, uh, adjustments of 2.5%. That's why there's other things that end up uh, in that line item. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Abby Miller, and I'm from uh, Nashua, uh, Nashua Road. Um, I just wanted to address the budget. Um, I, you know, I think it was a pleasant surprise that it wasn't really going up until we heard from Josh uh, some of the stuff that... Um, is going to happen over the next four or five years with uh, the budget going up another deficit of, say, $2 million. Uh, that's going to hit hard. And um, I'm just wondering whether we've really, like, I just heard something that bothered me immediately. Um, they said something about. Uh, um, an employee of the of the uh, city is given money in lieu of their uh, health care costs, um, and then they take their health care with their spouse. Okay, now I was never given that when I worked for a company. Many different companies, they were banks. They never gave you the money back that you didn't use for health care. They just said, good luck and go get health care from, you know, the other, the other company. So I'm just wondering why we're doing that because I know that that's not something that happens on a regular basis. Uh, Mr. Haddad, town manager. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The reason we, we negotiated that particular issue with our unions this year a family plan health insurance costs the town $20,000 for that plan for each employee that takes the family plan. We put an incentive in the, in the contract this year to allow employees to opt out. They have to be on the insurance for, for the preceding year, so they were, we were already paying $20,000 for that. And then we end up paying them 25% of our costs. So there's a net savings of $16,000 in the budget by providing that incentive. 
it seemed to make sense during negotiations to try to control that, and that's why we added that to the budget this year. Thank you. Okay. Over here, yes, sir. Oh, thank yeah, you, Mr. Mr. Eason. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bruce Eason, Martins Pond Road. Following up on Mr. Deegan's comment, what would be the consequences of town meeting voting down the budget tonight? What are the follow-on aspects of that, that event? Mr. Thank Green. <laughs> Uh, your guess is as good as mine. No, uh, if we don't have a budget as a town, it's, it, you know, that's a problem. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would suggest to anyone here who's inclined to vote against the budget, do not vote against the budget, but rather make a motion to amend the budget. That is your right as a member of town meeting. Uh, if, if, uh, if you think that we're spending something we shouldn't be spending, you can make a motion to amend the budget. But to vote against the budget, if we were to fail to have a budget, um, we would most likely, I guess, end up at a special town meeting? We would have to pass a ba budget a balanced budget by June 30th if we cease to operate. Right. If we don't have a balanced budget uh, by June 30th, we cease to operate. So uh, if it went down tonight, we'd be scrambling to figure out how to get a budget by then and it, it could possibly include a special town meeting which guess what would cost the town money to run a special town meeting so again um, I would I would encourage people uh, I'm not saying that that you need to vote for this budget but what I am saying is if you don't like the budget uh, you should come prepared to to, to to offer amendments mr. Robertson uh, in regard to an override, uh, we discussed this in the FinCom, and, and an override in a year, I heard what Josh said, but, you know, we're 200000 and you say, okay, we're going to have an override. We're going to have an override for what? We're going to have an override for what we think we're going to spend next year. We don't even know what we're going to spend next year. We're going to have an override for what? Firefighters are already in the budget, but they're already in the budget. So the, the override for, is for what? We're already positive. We know there's an issue next year. We know we might have an override next year. We don't know that for sure. So why would we do an override this year and take money out of your pocket? Well, we don't know how much money we're going to need next year. We may not need any. We might need $750,000. We have a committee put together, as you heard, that's going to be looking at this situation and say, what is the override? Do we need one? Maybe we will. But when we get there, we're going to have an education, an educated guess or estimate of what we're looking at. We're going to have a budget. At that time, it's going to say, hey, we've got a $750,000 problem, and here's the line items we need to address. Right now, we're looking at a number that says we don't know what an override might be because we've got 200000 surplus. It could be this. It could be that. But, you know, next year is going to be different than this year. So why even go for an override in a year that you don't even know what the facts are for what the override might be? So we, on the FinCom, voted against an override when we don't even know what the issues may be. So to cancel a budget this year for there might be an override next year, I believe is the wrong answer. We should wait till next year, see what the issues are, see what we can solve in the course of the year, and then next year if we have to prioritize stuff, we'll have the right stuff to prioritize. We can take out this or that or this, or we might decide for an override. We can't say what we're going to take out now, we're going to add it now because we already have everything in the budget that we believe the select board wanted, they voted for it, we voted for it. We're asking you to vote for it. If we have an issue next year, we will deal with it. We have to cut stuff out of the budget. We will cut stuff out. If you want an override to keep services where they are, then that's what you do. So I think we get rid of this override, and we just simply pass the budget and see what happens. Are there further comments, uh, Mr. Deegan? So basically what you need to understand, or what I tried to convey to you folks, is the $308,000 savings from the reduction in the assessment, in my opinion, is creating in a smoke and mirrors where it looks like we have enough money to afford things. And we're spending money that we don't have. So I'm hearing from the town manager, I'm hearing from the chair of the FinCom, that if somebody was to offer a motion, I am just proposing that that motion would equal the amount of the E&D uh, money that the district spent and the assessment reduction to the town, which is $308,000. How would that apply? We'd have to make a reduction in one or more of the line items that are here by $308,000. If that occurred and you voted in favor of that, we would be out of balance, uh, and that would trigger at least the necessity for an override for FY20 for the difference between what we're under the levy limit by and what that $308,000 figure is. Would that be correct? 
Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the, the heads moving correct. So if nobody else wants to offer a motion, I may go work on one while you spend some money. What are there comments, questions? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Um, Jennifer Evans, I'm looking, Josh, I don't know if you can help clarify this. So if there were um, the 308,000 E and D dollars that are being used to offset the operational costs, is that the money that typically would be used to, you know, that's, isn't that usually like the rainy day fund when there is an issue with roof buildings or the money that's used when there is like, you know, this year where we had the unexpected costs that came from out of district and so by using that 308,000 now this year, we won't have that as a rainy day fund for next year and coming years. So the $308,000. Ms. Gilbert? Yes, I'm so I think sorry. the question was directed to Mr. Deegan. Oh, sorry, I thought she was referring well, to me. Well, I'm, I'm okay with um, okay, okay. Ms. Gilbert Fine, answering Ms. Gilbert, it. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. No, that's quite all right. Anybody who can actually clarify it would be fine. <laughs> the $308,000 that's being discussed here today is uh, the district E&D. So the assessment was decreased by $308,000. It is a one-time fund. We have our own um, budget policies. They are very similar to Groton's. We have a minimum of a uh, certified E&D that would need to be present in order us, for us to utilize one-time funds. Under the situation where we have two member towns to accommodate, we strongly were collaborating with both towns. That is how we ended up using $308,000 of our E&D, which will not be repeated next year. So to your, to your question, it will not be repeated next year, and we will need to come up with $308,000 in Groton. Ms. Evans. So if I understand what you're saying is this money is going to be used now. So if next year or any time soon in the next few years, if an unexpected expense comes up, like this past year we had the unexpected out-of-district placement, we will have already spent that 308000 so that becomes, we don't have that in savings anymore. Like is typically the reason you have E&D. The savings of that $308,000 would be gone, but we didn't spend it now. We would be needing to spend it now in regards to that difference of 308, as Josh had mentioned. So whether we spend it now or we spend it later, it would need to be spent. So it just depending you're, upon. You're telling me operating wise you need it and you either get it through tax assessments, typical budget now, or you use the E&D money. So the assessment has been given to the town. So if we do not utilize E&D, then the assessment, first of all, we don't have to, the town of Groton does not have to use $308,000 of the E&D we had decreased towards the budget at all. But we did decrease that budget for two towns, not just one. So that is the reason why it is as it is right now. Mr. Green. Uh, just uh, a, a couple points. One is, uh, per, per Josh's comment of, of recovering the 308, um, as I mentioned earlier, we are actually 197 under the levy limit this year. Um, so, you know, there's a potential that, that, that an override, which we can't do at the moment because you'd need to put it on the ballot and we're too late to do that. <laughs> But um, that number wouldn't have to be 308. It could be uh, approximately $111,000. But the thing that I would say is that, you know, from the town perspective, right, and again, I think there's great collaboration. So you're seeing Marlene and I work very hard to make sure that we're, 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 we're not trying to talk for each other. <laughs> um, but the town policies, we have very specific policies around the amount of excess and deficiency funds as a percentage of our operating budget. And, and I know that the, um, the state provides guidance to the district as well. The district has been working uh, very diligently to increase their balance of E&D to get it within targeted ranges. So this year, I know that, that it was a hard discussion for them to choose to use E&D, but they did so knowing where they were within the, um, the, the guidance that they, and, and the targets that they have for their E&D fund. Um, 
So again, from, from my side, and I think I said this when I, when I presented, I, I don't necessarily think what they did was wrong. I don't want anybody to think what they did was necessarily wrong. Uh, and, and I just wanted to bring up the fact that, that it does make next year more difficult. And again, as I spoke earlier, I pointed out that the five-year forecast indicates that next year we're 750K in the hole. Well, last year, the five-year forecast indicated that I think, I think last year's five-year forecast indicated we were 300K in the hole this year. We are not 300K in the hole. In fact, we're 167 in the positive. So a $470,000 swing, right? Just because right now forecasts would indicate that we may be 750 in the hole next year does not mean we will be 750 in the hole next year. Again, we are working very diligently to be standing here next year saying that we are under the levy limit, we've given the schools what they need, we're presenting a budget for you that meets the town's priorities and values. Uh, to what Bud said, we had a healthy debate around, around you know, Prop 2 and a half overrides and whether we should do it this year, even though we provided the guidance that we didn't want to do a Prop 2 and a half override this year. And at the end of the day, what was determined was to do a Prop 2 and a half override this year when we, when we didn't need it, we're already under the levy limit, in anticipation of a potential deficit next year, which may or may not come to be, did not make sense. And so as a finance committee, again, we debated this heavily. We ended up where we ended up. We unanimously voted to bring this budget to you. We support it. We think it's the right budget. I appreciate where Josh is coming from. Uh, I think Josh and I um, both spoke on the same, uh, the same side of this argument frequently during this, this budget season. Uh, but uh, again, I, I just want to emphasize to you that, that we brought you a budget that uh, we can afford this year, that meets the values and the priorities of this town. Yes, we know that we have ongoing problems in the future, but again, we did, it would have appeared we did this year and we were able to address it and we're going to work hard to address it for next year as well. In the back, yes, uh, Ms. Collette. Uh, Ms. Allen would like to speak. On the wireless microphone, Ms. Allen, yes. Ms. Allen, Main Street, I move the question. We have a motion to move the question. Is there a second? A motion has been made and seconded to move the question. A motion to move the question suppresses all debate. It requires a two-thirds majority. If you vote to move the question, we will move directly to voting on the main motion, which is motion one, general government. If you vote against moving the question, debate will continue on motion one. All those in favor of moving the question signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed. The ayes have it. The question is moved by a two-thirds majority. We now go to the vote on motion one, general government. The main motion requires a majority vote. All those in favor of motion one, general government, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes have it by a majority vote. Motion one passes. Motion two, Ms. Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that $450,361 be hereby appropriated for land use departments as represented by lines 1200 through 1281 in Appendix A of the warrant. Each line item to be considered as a separate appropriation for the purpose voted. And to meet this appropriation, the sum of 4,386 be transferred from excess and deficiency fund, free cash, and the sum of $445,975 be raised from the fiscal year 2020 tax levy and other general revenues of the town. Motion two has been moved and seconded, Ms. Leonard. Uh, this represents an increase of $17,983 for that group of departments, or a 4.16% increase. The Finance Committee unanimously voted to support this budget. Are there questions or comments on motion to land use departments, lines 1200 through 1281 in Appendix A of the warrants? Requires a majority vote. Seeing no one get up. Uh, all those in favor of motion two signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion two passes by a majority votes.
Motion three, Mr. Whitefield. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that $4,358,041 be appropriated for protection of persons and property as represented by lines 1300 to 1372 in Appendix A of the warrant. Each line item to be considered as a separate appropriation for the purposes voted. And to meet this appropriation, the sum of $5,597 be appropriated uh, be transferred from excess and deficiency fund, free cash, the sum of $300,000 be appropriated from fire and emergency medical services, receipts reserved, and the sum of $4,052,444 be raised from the fiscal year 2020 tax levy and other general revenues of the town. Motion three has been moved and seconded, Mr. Whitefield. So this is an increase of $229,706 or 5.56%. Uh, consisting of the 64K or 64,000 due to the two new firefighters, which after talking with the chief was unanimously recommended by the finance committee and then the rest primarily due to contractual salary increases and performance incentives. Okay, Mrs. Pine, do you want to make a minority report as a member of the board of selectmen? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, yeah, as Josh had indicated, I also was opposed. I am opposed to this particular section of the budget, which includes the additional two firefighters. Um, I had been considering offering an amendment, but I have decided not to do that. I am going, however, to share my reasons for opposing the addition of the two firefighters. The fire department engaged a consulting firm, Municipal Resources, to do an analysis of their staffing needs in 2017. It has been widely stated in re recent months that this report recommended adding four new firefighters. I'm gonna read you what the actual recommendation was. It says, if the community wishes to enhance the service level and provide 24-hour coverage, the town should consider adding four additional career staff over a period of two years, adding two in the first year and expanding the hours of coverage, and then adding two more positions in year two, providing 24-7 coverage. So again, it starts with the word if, and it says if we want to go to 24-7 coverage, we should consider adding, adding four. This is not a recommendation to hire more firefighters. It is a suggestion that how we should go about it if we decide that we want 24-7 coverage. Um, I don't believe that there's been enough public discussion or exploration of alternatives for anyone to know yet if the town of Groton wants to go to 24-7 coverage. The, the select board created the fire department task force study committee last summer as a way to begin the public discussion on this topic. And then we on the select board pushed them to complete their work before they had time to do a community survey. They did hold one public forum but as their final report says, this meeting was dominated by two groups advocating for more firefighters, and the atmosphere at the forum was not conducive to dissenting opinions. I was at that meeting, and I completely agree with that assessment. Um, I want to remind the voters that this past October, we voted to add two firefighters midway through the fiscal year. Those two people began working in January. Adding two more now would mean adding four people in 2019, almost doubling the department from five to nine in one year. As you've already heard, uh, the decisions made by the school committee in their budgeting process have uh, made the, the cost of adding uh, firefighters in this budget uh, relatively easy. It's, there's not a big impact on the budget. But as you've also heard, next year is a different story. Our current projections are showing a deficit of $750,000. So if that holds true, we will have to make uh, either major cuts, such as reducing personnel, or we will have to approve an override or some combination of both, or find new revenue someplace. To me, it seems unwise to add staff now, knowing that we may need to lay these very people off next year. Before we make a decision to add an ongoing budget cost, I think we need a larger community discussion and more thorough analysis of alternatives than we've had so far. 
According to the data presented by the Fire Task Force, 21% of our calls come between 6 p.m. and midnight. But right now, we do not have coverage after 6 p.m. We do have one person in the station until 8 p.m., but by uh, policy and practice, we need two people there before any vehicle can leave to answer a call. So effectively, we don't have coverage after 6 p.m. I think there should be more exploration of revising the scheduling and using the two new staff members that we approved in the fall to cover more of those uncovered evening hours. We are now staffed from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., which is when 70% of our calls come in. But we would cover 91% of our calls if we were staffed from 6 a.m. to midnight every day. If Groton had experienced a large increase in nighttime calls, it would make some sense to me to move to 24-7 coverage. But despite the large amount of data that was gathered and presented by the fire task force, I have not seen any data that shows an increase in nighttime calls. I have learned through this process that emergency medical calls are far more frequent than fire calls. The most severe and time sensitive medical calls require an advanced life support or an ALS ambulance which is staffed with paramedics and can provide cardiac support and services requiring needles, such as IVs and intubation. Groton does not have an ALS ambulance and has no plans to get one. So if you call 911 with a very severe medical emergency, the dispatcher calls an ALS ambulance from a neighboring town. This will still be true, even if we have 24-hour coverage at our fire station. So the response time for ALS ambulances, the ones for the, that are needed for the most urgent and frightening medical calls, will not change whether or not we hire two more firefighters. In closing, I want to acknowledge that emotions are very high on this topic, as public safety is always an emotionally charged topic. There is no question that in an ideal world, Everyone would have a fully staffed firehouse with highly skilled firefighters and EMTs and fully equipped ALS ambulances open 24 hours very close to their own house. But in the real world that we live in, these services cost money. So we as citizens and taxpayers have to weigh the choices and alternatives and decide how much we are willing to pay. For many years, we as a town have managed without overnight coverage at the fire station. What we have to decide tonight is whether this is the time to change that or whether we can live without overnight coverage for a while longer. Thank you. Mr. Green. So as uh, Mr. Whitefield uh, stated earlier, the, the Finance Committee voted unanimously specifically to support the hiring of the two fire uh, department personnel, and I, I just wanted to just give a little commentary on that. Um, it, with respect to the hiring of two additional fire department personnel, it feels like there have been two different discussions happening, and they're frequently not happening in the same room. And one of them absolutely has been a very emotional uh, conversation. It's about seven by 24 coverage. And, and we talked about that as well in the Finance Committee. And we have Finance Committee members who, on the, on the notion of staffing overnight itself, feel that it's warranted. But what I will say is that uh, the Finance Committee um, met with the chief after the task, force, uh, the task force's report was delivered to the town. We felt we needed to speak directly to the chief to understand what his thoughts were and why he wanted to add the two personnel. And there's a, a whole nother reason that, um, that, that hasn't been discussed tonight. And so I just want, and, and, and I actually think this is the reason uh, from the sense of the conversation the committee had prior to us voting unanimously to support hiring these two firefighters, it was this was the conversation that really I think drove the unanimous support among, amongst the, uh, the, the finance committee. And that's that, um, we actually do at the moment have an issue with our on-call fire department in terms of the number of people who are on the on-call fire department uh, rosters, as well as more importantly, 
um, the number of people who are actively and regularly turning out to calls. And in fact, when we added the two additional firefighters at last town meeting, it was specifically because we were re reaching a point of a crisis. Um, we were relying on a, a very, like a, literally a handful of volunteers, uh, some of which were, were getting close to burning out, if not already burning out. And if we got injuries amongst them, we were not going to have a call fire department. So we hired those two firefighters. The task force went upon their, their, their path studying this. What we asked the fire chief was, is this about seven by 24 coverage or is this about, you know, again, bolstering what we're doing with the on-call fire department? And he made a very strong case that this is about bolstering the on-call fire department. And in fact, what you see in the numbers that I presented to you earlier is we're decreasing incentive pay by $60,000. That incentive pay went to on-call firefighters who would be willing to come man the station. The on-call firefighters held a vote and they said, yes, please take that incentive away from us and hire two more people because they understood that we need to bolster the full-time fire department. Now, those two full-time firefighters give us the added benefit that we'll have some staffing overnight, but what they definitely do is they alleviate additional pressure on the on-call fire department, right? So we're not gonna burn those guys out. And by the way, we have more full-timers that we can call on when we need someone to cover another shift. Or, or if they are living closer in town, they can also uh, go to other shifts, uh, to other calls that they may not be, uh, they may not be on, on duty, but they can still go to those other things. So the finance committee looked at this. Um, we looked at the conversation we've been having with the chief over numerous years around the challenges of on-call fire departments in modern day America. It's been a trend, not just here, but across the country. It is difficult to attract people and keep people. We are having those problems. And so we are concerned as a finance committee that if we don't help the chief relieve some of that pressure and allow him to build back up that on-call capability, we are headed to not hiring two new firefighters, but I don't know how many firefighters, eight more? And as a finance committee, we're concerned about that. So we are trying to support um, the fire department's efforts to relieve the pressure that they are currently experiencing and get into a place where they can start rebuilding the on-call capabilities and hopefully avoid much larger expenses in the future. The chair, will, the chair will now open the floor to debate and remind voters you're under a three minutes time limit and that three minutes includes if you yield the floor for an answer from someone. So don't be surprised if your three minutes is up faster than perhaps you think it was. Uh, in order that I saw them standing at the microphone, I'd go with Mr. Geiger first. I want to point out to you that um, Mrs. Pine's comments in one area may have suggested to you that uh, if there's an emergency in the evening or during the night here in town, that, um, see, that when it's reported uh, seems to be serious enough for an ALS, we don't sit around and wait for the ALS to eventually get here. We first send our EMTs who are well-trained and very capable of helping sustain life until more sophisticated equipment can be brought to the scene. I encourage you to follow the guidance of a very fine fire chief that we have in town and not second guess this, it's too important. Thank you. In the back. Yes. Hi, Jennifer Evans again. I was a member of the Fire Task Force Committee and I do think a lot of the stuff presented tonight is not perfectly clear. I do wanna point out, if you look at 13, line 1311 in, in the budget, I wanna make it clear, we all, we're talking about four new firefighters in a matter of one year, going from five career to nine, doubling. Um, you'll see that we, we're talking that um, FY 2018 was 770,000. The FY 19 was we added two for half a year, and that's then where we build from. So I do wanna make it clear that there's the two that we hired plus two more. I wanna go back to October. The reason we had this emergency hiring six, you know, for six months 
was because of the issue with call. I think that is a huge issue. There are towns who have addressed this. I do think there may be recruiting issues here. I have not seen any recruitment effort hit my house. I've been told there were signs. I've not seen anything. I have um, two boys in their 20s, and I have a daughter who is a firefighter. And you would think that we would see some recruiting. If we're not seeing the recruiting effort, then I'm sure others are missing it. This town has changed. There are a lot of people who are working from their homes. There's a lot of things we can do to address the call issue, which is important. Right now, we had overworked firefighters. We upped the staffing in the you know, effective January to relieve that effort. By going, hiring two more to go to 24 hours a day, we're now going to go right back to the exact same staffing levels that we had last year where people were overworked and we needed to hire two more. This is putting us right back to two people on the, um, two people on the weekends as opposed to the four that we have right now. I think that we have no idea how the first two have helped us. I think there's a lot of problems out there and reducing the um, call pay by 60K is not your best way to inspire new call firefighters. And you need those call people uh, to, to respond, even in the middle of the night. I, I see you, Mr. Press. I would like to step a little out of order and call on our fire chief, uh, Steele McCurdy. <laughs> Chief McCurdy, please hold your applause. You'll have a chance to express your opinion when you vote. Ms. Chief McCurdy. First thing I would like to do is I would like to take the opportunity to thank all of the call firefighters here in Groton. If everybody could give them a round of applause for their dedicated efforts. So we can debate numbers till the cows come home. We have talked about it for now several years as we talked about increased staffing in the fire department. While Mr. Green was talking, I recall this conversation uh, at the finance committee meeting where I relayed my experiences in the town of Littleton. For those of you that you don't know, I spent 16 years in the town of Littleton, serving in every capacity from firefighter all the way up to the interim fire chief. Many of the issues that we're experiencing today in retaining, recruiting, and getting call firefighters to respond to calls, I have been through before. I have read this book, and we have seen that there is serious consequences if we fail to act soon enough. I would ask you tonight to support the fire department because the way we're doing business today is not sustainable in the long term. Thank you. Mr. Press. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I want to add a few facts to this. The number of calls during unmanned hours at 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. is 318. If I remember correctly, the number of calls between midnight and 6 a.m. is about 132, one every three days. 62% of the calls across the board are for medical services and rescue. The response time during manned hours, that is 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., is 3.9 to 6.9 minutes. It's a very, very tight range. If you look at the response times during unmanned hours of 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., it's 7.4 to 24 minutes. That is an incredible range. If you look at the variance of that, it's huge. And if you look at the actual studies, longer response times cause major increases in mortality rates, particularly in, in rural areas. Uh, I have a thing on talk about Groton called facts or stubborn things, and you can find a lot of that data there if you subscribe to that. Or you can contact me directly, and I will send you the information. Now, here's my example. I did a stupid thing on November 6, 2018 at 3.30 in the afternoon. I tried carrying a television and a bag of electronics down the stairs of my house. I did a header about halfway down into a bookcase. 
I had severe bleeding and neck injury. Nobody was home. I didn't have my cell phone. Fortunately, my wife came home a few minutes later and she found me standing over the sink about 12 feet away from where the accident happened. This whole part of my scalp was over my ear. There was blood all over the floor. My wife called 911 and they were there in a couple of minutes. I had two BLS, basic life services, EMTs, and I had the chief. And they did everything they could possibly do to stop the bleeding. And they succeeded to a point. Yes, they then had ALS folks come in from Westford that then took me to the hospital. When I got to the hospital, there were four nurses waiting for me. And when they rolled me into the emergency room, I heard the nurse say, we have to stop this bleeding or he's going to bleed out. That's not something you want to hear any time in your lifetime. I also cracked my C1 vertebrae. Fortunately, it didn't cause any damage. So my life was saved by the rapid response type of the Groton Fire Department. Yes, basic life services, but if they hadn't come, I'd probably be dead. And as Miss Ellen said to me months ago, all right, if that happened in the middle of the night, you'd be dead. Thank you. In the back to my left, yes, sir. Yeah, my name's Matt Pisani, Pleasant Street, and also a member of the call department. <clears throat> I might take a little issue with the recruitment. Um, issue because you I'd say you don't get out of the house much but realistically that chief has done virtually everything you can do to try and recruit people sir please don't um, you direct your comments to anyone else okay make them but to I, me I, it, please it's a, the recruitment issue um, if you if you are if you receive mail in Groton you receive something with my picture on it we have direct mail we have had booths here at town meeting we had every Groton fest at every river fest um, the chief has done virtually everything in his power to recruit new people. Bottom line is this is not like joining a committee where you don't have to invest time. This is a serious commitment. Um, in order to do it, it's a 240 hours, nights and weekends at a fire academy. If you want to go on to be an EMT, that's an additional 165 hours. It's a serious commitment in order to do this. So it's, it's very tough to convince people to do this, to get up in the middle of the night, to go on a call for virtually no pay, I mean, the folks that, that do it, do it because of, we want to give back to the community. So um, realistically, it's, it's a hard sell for the chief to put people in this call department. Um, I love it. I'm going to continue to do so. I am all in favor of the additional two people for the reason that it'll take a little bit of burden off of the folks who do get up. because. You know, all of us have jobs during the day. So come 3 o'clock in the morning, we get up on a call, we get home at 5, we get another hour's sleep. It affects our jobs, it affects our livelihoods, and it affects our health. So the additional two people will at least get the ambulance rolling and call people can backfill that, or the engine rolling and then the call people can backfill that. Call department's not going anywhere. It's always going to be here. But it's just getting people to support the de or to join the department, it's a hard sell. So, thank you for the time. In the back, yes, sir. Thank you. First of all, I want to take and compliment the chief on all the hard work that he has done. I also want to make a comment about once in a while I tune in to the meetings in the town hall. And I have seen the conversations regarding this committee. In my opinion, and I've been here a few years, enough is enough on beating up the chief, beating up the fire department. Enough is beating up the police department last year. And you know what happened. We do not want this chief to take a walk. I have never, in my experience, and I've been on that board and other boards, it's time to let them do their job and stop appointing study committees to study study committees. And that's what's happening here. I would say, and I can't move the question because I'm standing up making a couple of comments, but I do have a little bit of experience in working with people like this, and I, I just can't. Uh, 
support stronger the, the the volunteers that we have on the fire department when we used to have when we had a fire uh, several years ago the highway department the electric light department came out we had people right there that doesn't happen anymore people have to make a living so now we're going to be adding hopefully two more firemen there are fire women I don't know which I don't care anyway I'm urging this group here to afford to support this budget for the fire department the two new people thank you very much mr. Deegan is next Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Well, certainly this issue of routing uh, firefighters and going to a 24-7 department is something that has been discussed for a long, long time now. This isn't a new concept, and we've hit the wall. And as everybody's pointed out, including the call firefighters that unanimously support moving forward to this, I support it. I voted no for $2.5 million in the first two motions. I'm voting yes all the way through from now on. I hope you'll all support this. It's time to go to 24-7. In the back, yes, ma'am. Heidi Janiskevich. Um, I just wanted to make another point about how important fast response times are. So if you were at home um, any, at any time of the day and you or a loved one suffer a cardiac arrest, um, which is a true cardiac emergency, uh, and you are in need of high quality CPR, which is a BLS skill, and defibrillation, which is another BLS skill, so the AED, the automatic um, external defibrillator. For every minute that goes by that you are not getting either high quality CPR or access to an AED, your survival chances decrease by 10%. So if you have a three minute response time, you may potentially have a 70% chance of being resuscitated if that time goes to, like we were talking about overnights, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. My math says that that's not good odds for you. So I want to thank the chief on all the hard work, and I also support hiring firefighters. In the back, yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm Ashley Palmisano. Uh, I have a different train of thought. A couple years ago, my father, he passed away in a fire here in Groton. Um, and it was at 11.26 at night. Um, surrounding towns came. Uh, everybody in the fire department came. And uh, I didn't find out till 3 o'clock in the morning. Came in the next morning. And uh, these guys are just working nonstop. So to say that you know, they don't need two extra firefighters. It's just wrong. I've seen it firsthand. And, you know, you know, my dad's not here. And it was in the middle of the night. And I think the quicker uh, response time, um, having those two extra firefighters um, behind these guys who work really hard each night, uh, the e EMS personnel, and usually, you know, all the calls, they all happen at once, so the more the merrier. And, um, and just coming from a person who's experienced that loss, and to kind of hear it, you know, tonight, um, we, we, we really do need those, those two firefighters, so, so. Over in the back, yes, sir. Evan Boucher, Chickabee Row, uh, make a motion to move the question. The motion has been made to move the question. Is there a second? second? The motion has been made and seconded to move the question. It suppresses debate. It is not debatable. If you vote to move the question, we'll move directly to the main motion on the floor, which is motion three. If you vote against moving the question, debate will continue. The motion to move the question requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it by a majority vote. The question is moved. We now go to the main motion. Motion three, protection of persons and property, requires a majority vote. I'm sorry, the motion to move the question passed by a two-thirds majority. Was the chair incorrect on that? Okay, just wanna clarify that for the record. The main motion, motion three, protection of persons and property requires a majority vote. 
All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes have it. By a majority vote, motion three carries. <laughs> motion four, schools, Mr. Robertson. Do I do these all at once or one at a time? Do them one at a time, sir. Motion 4A, Neshoba Valley Regional Technical High School. Thank you, moderator. I move that the sum of $728,802 be raised and appropriated from the fiscal year 2020 tax levy and other general revenues of the town for the Neshoba Valley Regional Technical High School as represented by line 1400 in Appendix A of the warrant. Motion 4A has been moved and seconded, Mr. Robertson. This represents an increase of $171,507, or 30.77%. The increase, as you heard earlier, is primarily the result of our student enrollment increasing by eight, going from 36 students to 44 students. The Finance Committee recommends this unanimously. Chairs, under the impression there are representatives from the Neshoba Valley Technical <laughs> School here tonight? Yes? In the back? Yes, they're here. Okay. So they're available to answer questions. Are there any questions or comments on motion 4A? Those folks, are you folks going to ask a question or are you departing? It looks like they're leaving. Okay. Motion 4A requires a majority vote. No questions or comments. Then we'll move straight to the vote. All those in favor of motion 4A signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Motion four passes by a majority vote, or unanimous vote, sorry. Motion 4B, Mr. Robertson. I move that the sum of $22,063,256 be hereby raised and appropriated from the fiscal year 2020 tax levy and other general revenues of the town for the Groton Dunstable Regional School District as represented by lines 1410 through 1413, as shown in Appendix A of the warrant. Motion 4B has been moved and seconded. Mr. Robertson. This represents an increase of $1,048,866, of 5.19%. With a presentation, the chairwoman of the school committee, Marlene Gilbert. So we're going to start off today um, with a budget comparison without capital for you. As you can see, it's 4.62%. The difference, as Bud had mentioned with the 5.19, is the difference of the um, state funding being flat. So the 4.62 is our actual expenditure growth of the budget. Here you'll see the pie chart in regards to how it divvies up. Much like the municipal, most of our budget is um, comprised of the salaries and insurance benefits. Um, again, the growth of increase of the budget, 4.62%. Within the budget, you'll see some FTE changes. Uh, we did have an um, operational audit for every single department in our district. Um, I'm, I'm hoping everyone in this room knows at this point, since we've been going about that project for the last two years. Um, in that audit, it did point out two different areas of, of uh, staffing deficits, which was our maintenance department and our tech department. These two FTEs here will help remedy that factor. The other FTEs are to able, enable us to move forward our five-year strategic plan, as well as to provide students with the, the services needed currently in our district. It is important to note that this also was able to be done while consuming quite a, quite a bit of unexpected cost, about $639, roughly $1,000, um, by, by way of almost saving close to $400,000 by implementing audit recommendations over the last year and a half. There's some factors that are affecting our assessments. 
Um, Gary Green did touch upon some of them, but this is a little bit more in detail for you. Our budget expenditure, expenditure increase, as, as I had said several times already, is 4.62. Increase of out of school district tuitions, $259,637,044. Charter school assessment, $137,797,000. Uh, $797. County retirement assessment, um, almost doubled this year, $108,754. In-district co collaborative programs, $115,000. And again, unfortunately, state aid is flat. It remains to be flat, unfortunately. Um, don't see any change in that in the, in the current near future. We did have some out of district placements, uh, special education um, specifically. There is an option um, in some districts to file for ex extraordinary relief. Um, it's based on many different factors, um, but due to the fact that we did not exceed 25% from the previous um, budget, we were not eligible for, qu for any of the reimbursements for the extended relief, so we did have to consume them in our budget. Um, our increase year over the year is approximately $300,000 for our special education for the increase of the foundation budget. Um, unfortunately, it just wasn't enough to, to get refund by the government, but enough to really make a s significant impact in a budget. As we mentioned, we used D&D &D in our budget this year to offset assessments. Um, mainly it was the consideration for Dunstable. They um, are having quite a difficult time this particular year. They are acknowledging the fact that they will be needing an override to um, support their municipal and school budget. This year was not the year for them to do so. They will be attempting to do that next year um, in order to fund their town's expenses. Um, when we did utilize that e and um, due to our regional agreement, it does affect the assessment in Groton as well. So that is that $380,000 that has been discussed several times tonight. You'll see that the E&D percentage for the FY19 balance, this is including reimbursement ex expectations of roughly about 48% uh, from the feasibility study that we're about to embark on as we speak. We already have gotten the OPM that's already on its way to be voted in with the MSBA hopefully next week. So um, the E&D, we have budget policies just like the town. Um, our budget policy requires E&D to be utilized for one-time expenses with some, some um, areas where we can deviate from that. And that would be to maintain services, uh, to pre prevent cuts from happening within our school as long as we have basically a minimum balance of 3% in our E&D. And as you can see, we have 3.17 with the utilization of $400,000 of E&D this particular year. Being that we have E&D at 3.17%, it does not look like it would be likely we will be able to do this again next year, and that is what J Josh was referencing. The assessment to Groton, as you can see, is here. Um, we had quite a, a significant decrease in um, debt um, and capital expenses compared to previous year. And that is why you see uh, the overall assessment to Groton actually is um, lower when considering the capital. Last year we had that big capital expense of the wire infrastructure um, for those that have attended town meeting and voted to approve that. We appreciate it. Um, and that is basically what brought us to the overall assessment of the 3.12. So coming here tonight, I thought a lot about um, presenting the budget to you and, and looking at that number, because that's a large number in, in any capacity. It's not, it's not an um, exorbitant number. It doesn't include things that are unnecessary. Uh, we've done our due diligence. We've done audits. We've done some very painful staking decisions. Um, you'd have to be blind not to see all the different individuals holding signs um, saying not to outsource cafeteria most recently. Um, it is what it is, and we've been trying to do exactly what we can to get the budget approved for the students. They only have one, one time at each grade. So when I think about what, what are we getting for the return of our investment, 
I want to show you what we're getting for the return of our investment by use of what we've gotten within this year and what we can expect to get in, in future years. And you can vote yes at the end of this presentation for my budget, but don't hold back the collapse when you see what is coming up on, st on the screen. Our elementary school, after strategically spending funds to increase services <clears throat> where we needed them, we are, out of 52 schools within close to 1,300, we're acknowledged by DESE this year for high achievement, something to be very proud of. <laughs> we're champions. I don't know if you all know that. Volleyball, baseball, our DNI folks were here. I don't have the picture of those girls up here. I actually stole a different picture from a website. Um, if I could found it, I would include it every. I only have so many slides, and we only have about 365 days to get through town meeting. So this is the best I could do. So we are champions at many different levels. <laughs> Our students are creative learners. They're fantastic. They're phenomenal. We put on plays. We build robots. We compete. Not only that, but our, our kids that actually do these things also give back to the young, younger ones. The robotomies, they were helping with the Girl Scouts getting their badges. All sorts of different accomplishments that can't fit on any slides. But you really should understand that the money that you approve go to these kids and allow them to achieve fantastic things and be able to learn in ways that will make them succeed in our years to come. I don't think this one needs any introduction, does it? No. Every year, invited somewhere, every year they go and perform. One of our proudest pieces of our district, our choir. And now they're going to Spain. If you want to donate to help them get there, you can go on their website as well. They're going April 2020 to make us proud. And now, <clears throat> of course, the arts. There's plays. We have some incredible artists in our district. They really are talented. Some, some of them are actually National Silver Key Scholastic Awarded Writing, Drawing, Painting. It's phenomenal accomplishments. They will go far and they will continue to make our town proud. And again, the funding for the staffing, the funding for the different programs, this is where your money goes. This allows our students to succeed. If anyone has any questions, Thank throw you. them at me. Thank you, Ms. Gilbert. Are there any committee, other committee reports? The chair doesn't have any. Uh, the floor is now open for debate on motion 4B. Are there any comments or questions? Requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Motion 4B passes by a majority vote. <laughs> Mr. Robertson? Is this motion 4BB? 4BB? Okay. I move that the sum of $479,012 be hereby transferred from the Groton Dunstable Regional School District Capital Stabilization Fund to the Groton Dunstable Regional School District to pay for the capital assessment from said school district as represented by line 1414 in Appendix A of the warrant. Motion has been made and seconded, Mr. Robertson. This represents an increase of $53,587, or 12.60%. The FinCom unanimously approved this. Are there any questions or comments on motion 4BB? Requires a majority vote. 
All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have in motion 4BB passes by a majority votes. Mr. Manugi in motion five. I move that $2,237,722 be hereby appropriated for the Department of Public Works as represented by lines 1500 through 1561 as shown in appendix A of the warrant. Each line item to be considered as a separate appropriation for the purposes voted. And to meet this appropriation, $3,988 be transferred from the excess and deficiency fund free cash and $2,233,734 be raised from the fiscal year 2020 tax levy and other general revenues of the town. Motion five has been moved and seconded, Mr. Minugan. This is a 2% increase over the fiscal year 19 budget, primarily due to wages and solid waste tipping fees. The Finance Committee recommends unanimously. Are there questions or comments on motion five? Lines 1500 through 1561 in Appendix A. Requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Motion five passes by a unanimous vote. Motion six, Mr. Prest. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. This is Library and Citizen Services. I move that the sum of $1,674,572 be hereby appropriated for Library and Citizen Services as represented by lines 1600 through 1703 as shown in Appendix A of the warrant. Each line item to be considered as an appropriation, the sum of $4,046 nope. be transferred. Go back, sir. Each line item to be considered as a separate appropriation, and you skip down the line. For the purposes voted and to meet the appropriation. Right. The sum of $4,046 to be transferred from the excess and efficiency fund, free cash, and $1,670,526 be raised from the fiscal year 2020 tax levy or and other general revenues of the town. Motion six has been made and seconded. Mr. Prest. This should be a fairly simple one. If you go through the numbers in the back of Appendix A, you'll see that the increase from FY 2020 from 2019 is $16,254, or 0.98% over that for 2019. Are there questions or comments on motion six? Requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion six passes by a unanimous vote. Motion seven, Mr. Robertson. I move that $1,607,259 be hereby appropriated for debt service as represented by lines 2000 through 2007 in Appendix A of the warrant. Each line item to be considered as a separate appropriation for the purposes voted and to meet the appropriation in the sum of 98714 be transferred from the excess and deficiency fund free cash in the sum of $1,508,545 be raised from the fiscal year 2020 tax levy and other general revenues of the town. Motion seven has been moved and seconded, Mr. Robertson. This represents an increase of $218,869, or 15.76%. This increase is the result of adding the full year senior center debt service to the budget somewhat offset by a reduction in our in levity debt services. Are there any questions or comments on motion seven? Floor is open for debate. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Oh, no. Um, any questions or comments requires a majority vote. All those in favor of motion seven signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion seven passes by a unanimous vote. 
Motion eight, Ms. Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the sum of $4,036,106 be raised and appropriated for employee benefits as represented by lines 3,000 through 3,012 and Appendix A of the warrant. Each line item to be considered as a separate appropriation for the purposes voted. Motion eight has been moved and seconded, Ms. Leonard. This is actually a reduction of 0.94% from last year or $38,154. The Finance Committee unanimously voted to support this budget. Are there are questions or comments on Motion 8. Requires a majority vote. All those in favor of Motion 8 signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Motion 8 passes by a unanimous vote. Motion 9, Mr. Minugian. I move that $1,262,219 be appropriated to be spent by the Groton Water Commission to defray all operating expenses, interest charges, and principal payments on bonds outstanding as they accrue and any reimbursement to the town of the Groton Water Enterprise Fund as represented in the Water Enterprise Budget in Appendix A of the Warren. Each line item to be considered as a separate appropriation for the purposes voted. And to meet this appropriation, the sum of $75,000 be hereby transferred from the Water Enterprise Accession Deficiency Fund. The sum of $1,036,977 be appropriated from the water rates and fees. And the sum of $150,242 in the town's general fund operating budget be raised and appropriated to be allocated to the Water Enterprise for fiscal year 2020. Motion nine has been moved and seconded, Mr. Minugan. This is a 1.25% reduction over the fiscal year 19 budget. The Finance Committee recommends unanimously. There are questions on motion nine. Requires a majority vote. Any questions or comments? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Motion nine passes by a unanimous vote. Mr. Minugi in motion 10. I move that 700 $25,408 for the Groton Sewer Commission to expend it to defray all operating expenses, interest charges, and principal payments on bonds outstanding as they accrue and any reimbursement to the town for the Groton Sewer Enterprise Fund as represented in Appendix A of the warrant. Each line item to be considered as a separate appropriation for the purposes voted. And to meet this appropriation, the sum of $71,518 be hereby transferred from sewer enterprise excess and deficiency. The sum of $626,273 be appropriated from sewer rates and fees, and the sum of $27,617 be raised and appropriated in the general fund operating budget to be allocated to the sewer enterprise for fiscal year 2020. Motion 10 has been moved and seconded, Mr. Minugian. This is a reduction of 0.39% over the fiscal year 19 budget. The Finance Committee recommends unanimously. There are comments or questions on motion 10. Requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Motion 10 passes by a unanimous vote. Motion 11, Mr. Duty. Thank you, moderator. Uh, good evening. I move that $211,776 be hereby appropriated to be spent by the Cable Access Commission to defray all operating expenses and any reimbursements to the town of the Local Access Cable Enterprise Fund, as shown in Appendix A of the warrant report. Each line item to be considered as a separate appropriation for the purposes voted and to meet this appropriation, the sum of 153347 be appropriated from local access cable fees and the sum of 58429 be raised and appropriated in the general fund operating budget to be allocated to the local access cable enterprise fund, uh, cable enterprise for fiscal year 2020. Motion 11 has been moved and seconded. Sir, is this your first time making a motion yeah. on the Finance Committee? Yes. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Duty. Uh, this represents a 0.5% increase from fiscal year uh, 2019, uh, and this was also uh, recommended unanimously by the FinCom. Are there any comments or questions on motion 11? Requires a majority vote. 
All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. The motion passes by a unanimous vote. Motion 12, Mr. Manugian. I move that the amount of $20,618 be appropriated for fiscal year 2020 budget for the Four Corners Sewer Enterprise as shown in Appendix A of the warrant. Motion 12 has been moved and seconded, Mr. Manugian. This is a 34% or $11,000 reduction from the fiscal year 19 budget. The Finance Committee recommends approval unanimously. Are there any questions on motion 12? Questions or comments? Requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Motion 12 passes by a unanimous vote. Motion 13, Mr. Whitefield. I move that the income from sales of electricity to private customers or for the electricity supply to municipal buildings together with receipts from jobbing accounts be appropriated for the Groton Electric Light Department, the whole to be expended by the manager of the Groton, Ele Groton Electric Light Department under the direction and control of the Groton Board of Electric Light Commissioners for expenses of the department for fiscal year 2020, as defined in section 57 of chapter 164 of the Mass General Laws, and that if said sum and said income shall exceed said expense for said year, such excess shall be transferred to the construction fund of said plant and appropriated and used for such additions thereto as may thereafter be authorized by the board, Groton Board of Electric Light Commissioners. Motion 13 has been moved and seconded, Mr. Whitefield. So this is the annual housekeeping motion to allow the Groton Electric Light Department to spend its uh, revenue for normal business operations recommended unanimously by the FinCom. Are there any questions on motion 13? Questions or comments? Requires a majority vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Motion 13 passes by unanimous vote. And that is the end of the operating budget motions. Article 5, Mr. Deegan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the town vote to transfer from the excess and deficiency fund free cash the sum of $169,000 to be expended by the town manager to be added to the other post-employment benefits liability trust fund as authorized by Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 32B, Section 20. Article 5 has been moved and seconded, Mr. Deegan. The town of Groton currently has a post-employment benefit liability of $9,926,135. It's been recommended uh, that we start to pay down that post-employment benefit uh, liability. So what we have been doing on an annual basis is putting money into this trust fund to at least cover what the current year's liability will be for our employees that have retired in their post-employment benefits. Uh, there's currently a balance of $207,655.76 in that account. The estimated amount to be expended during FY20 is 296700 excuse me, $973. So all we're doing by putting this money in basically is just covering what is recommended for us to put in to be expended on an annual basis. Certainly having a $10 million post-employment uh, liability for benefits is a, is a large number. And the reason that the recommendations were put in place was for uh, communities that went bankrupt in the past, like Detroit, uh, and didn't meet their obligations to their employees, uh, that they recommend that we at least set up this fund. That's what we did, and now please fund it. Are there questions or comments on Article 5? Mr. Geiger. I deferred my position on this article until town meeting. I wish to announce that I support Article 5. Thank you. Questions or comments on Article 5? Requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Article 5 passes by a unanimous vote. Article 6, Motion A, Mr. Deegan. Thank you again, Mr. Moderator. 
I move that the town vote to appropriate the sum of $650,000 to be expended by the town manager to purchase and equip a new Engine 3 for the fire department and all costs associated and related thereto, and that to meet this appropriation, the treasurer, with the approval of the select board, be authorized to borrow the sum of $650,000 under and pursuant to Chapter 44, Section 7, 1 of the general laws, or pursuant to any other enabling authority, and to issue bonds or notes of the town thereafter, and that the sum of $140,875 be transferred from the emergency medical services receipts reserved for appropriation to be, excuse me, to pay costs of the debt service on the borrowing authorized by this vote that will be payable in fiscal 20 and further that the town manager be authorized to contract for the accomplishment of the foregoing purpose, including the expenditure of all appropriated funds and any funds received from any source for such pur purchase, and further, that any premium received by the town upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote, lest any such premium be applied to the payment of the costs of the issuance of such bonds or notes that may be applied to the payment of costs approved by this vote in accordance with Chapter 44, Section 20 of the General Laws, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs by a like amount. Ar <laughs> Article 6, Motion A has been moved and seconded. Mr. Deegan. Well, town council earned their money writing that one. Uh, so. What we have done here is two trucks are becoming one. We're replacing engine number three, uh, and there will be no new rescue truck. The new truck that's going to be purchased will be a larger vehicle that will be able to accomplish both tasks with one vehicle, thus saving the town money, not having to have two vehicles. The way we're going to pay for this is first year will be through ambulance receipts, and those ambulance receipts were going to be uh, just north of $140,000, as indicated within the motion. Um, and then we're going to be getting a state house note for five years, and again, as I said, the first year through ambulance receipts. Subsequent years are going to be to be determined with the finance committee working in conjunction with the select board and the town manager to uh, determine whether the funds will come from capital stabilization or ambulance receipts or a combination of both or other sources of funds. Hopefully you all understand that. Are there questions or comments on the motion? Because this authorizes borrowing, it requires a two-thirds majority. All those in favor of Article 6, Motion A, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Motion A passes by a unanimous vote. Motion, Article 6, Motion B, Mr. Deegan. Thank you again, Mr. Moderator. I move that the town vote to transfer the sum of $60,000 from the emergency medical service receipts reserved for appropriation and to transfer the sum of $504,945 from the capital stabilization fund for a total sum of $564,945 to be expended by the town manager for the following capital items. Service one replacement, $60,000. Rubber tire excavator, $140,000. Dump truck, $40,000. IT infrastructure, $40,000. Dispatch center upgrade, $60,000. Municipal building repairs, $25,000. Police station improvements, $20,000. Tractor trailer unit, $40,000. Police cruisers, $109,845. Pool improvements, $15,000. Cart path improvements, $10,000. Triplex green mower, $5,100. Total, $564,945. Article 6, Motion B has been moved and seconded, Mr. Deegan. If anybody has specific questions on any of these things, I'd be happy to answer them. Or if you would like an explanation, I have a detailed explanation as to uh, what each item is. Uh, I don't know what the meeting's preference is. Are there comments or questions on motion B? 
This again requires a two-thirds majority to pass. All those in favor of the main motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Passes by a majority vote. I'm sorry, passes by a two-thirds majority vote. The chair did one no. Article seven, Mr. Geiger. Please uh, bear with me. Uh, this may be the longest sentence in the world. I move that the town vote to appropriate the sum of $4,620,250 to be expended by the town manager on fiscal 2019 and thereafter for the purpose of reconstructing, equipping, furnishing, and new construction to upgrade the Department of Public Works facilities and all other costs associated and related thereto including construction administration, on the site of the existing Department of Public Works facilities located at 600 Cow Pond Brook Road, Groton, Massachusetts, and that to meet this appropriation, the treasurer, with the approval of the select board, is authorized to borrow the sum of $4,620,250 under and pursuant to Chapter 44 Section 7, subsection 1 of the general laws or pursuant to any other enabling authority and to increase bonds or note, I'm sorry, to issue bonds or notes of the town therefore and to authorize the town manager to contract for and in the name of the town for such purpose and to do all things necessary for the accomplishment of the foregoing purpose including the expenditure of all appropriated funds and any funds received from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or any other source for such construction. And further, any premiums received by the town upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote, less any such premium applied to the payments of the cost of issuance of these bonds or notes may be applied to the payment of costs approved by this vote in accordance with chapter 44, section 20 of the general laws, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs by a like amount, provided, however, that no fund may be expended hereunder for this purpose unless and until the town approves a proposition two and a half debt exclusion pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 59, Section 21C, Subsection K, and Section 21C, Subsection M. Article 7 has been moved and seconded. Mr. Geiger, do you have anything more to say? We'll move to the presentation. Yes, the select board um, uh, voted uh, this evening um, uh, with four yes and one no to recommend this article. The finance took its position this evening and voted five affirmative and, and two nay uh, on this article. I have a little bit more, but I have to catch my breath. The 2018 fall town meeting appropriated funding to design and put out to bid improvements for the current DPW facility, as well as new construction to meet the needs of our public works department. Since funding was approved, the town manager appointed a building committee to assist in the design and oversight of the proposed improvements. The final construction documents have been advertised for bid with bids due prior to town meeting, a full presentation of costs and tax impact will be made to the 2000, at the 2019 Springtown meeting. If approved, this article would be contingent upon a debt exclusion vote at the annual town election on May 21st. We now have a presentation. Uh, Mr. Delaney, Highway Director, I believe he's joined by 
the Highway uh, Garage Committee members, Mr. Amaral, Mr. Valprest, and also architect Greg Yanchenko. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for being here tonight. I'm here to ask for your support for the rehab of the existing DPW facility. This is the building that DPW works out of every day and at times at night as well. All operations start here, whether it be mowing, tree work, paving, pothole repairs, trash pickup, plowing, sanding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whether it's regular work or emergency work, it all starts here. We are the support for all the other departments in town. We're the ones they call whenever they, there's something they get stuck or they can't do. This building also serves our maintenance depot and our wells our fuel depot for the town wide for vehicles for fueling. We outgrew this building the day we moved in back in 1989. I have ex expanded it to suit our needs over the year with as little as possible, as a lot of you probably know, and for years have kept us going in an outdated building. The work needs, that needs to be done now is, is stuff we can't do. The proposal which you are about to hear more about will bring our current building up to date and fully functional and construct a warehouse type building to keep our garage, to keep our vehicles in, keep them nice, dry. I wish we could have done this ourselves, but we can't, so I need your support and help so our team can continue to help and support the townspeople and the other departments in town. Thank you. Mr. Yanchenko. Good evening. What I'd like to present to you today, uh, tonight is some background on the DPW facilities as they currently exist and what we've proposed and gotten received bids on. So as Tom just went through, um, the obvious things are that the DPW takes care of the roads and sidewalks and operates the transfer stations. But one of the things that I think Tom glossed over pretty quickly is they also do all the maintenance on all the facilities around here. And they have also supported the um, building and development of some of the other facilities, for example, like the basketball court behind the library, which saved the uh, town, I think, in excess of $100,000 by having the DPW crews uh, construct that facility. They also mow the town greens as well as the athletics fields. And as Tom had mentioned, he assists the other um, departments in cases of emergency. For example, during the storms when the trees go down on the lines for the um, geld, typically the DPW is out there first removing those trees so geld can perform their work and get the power back on. And then, like you said, in general, he just supports the other departments. So this is a slide of the current facilities at um, Cal Pond Road. You'll see that each of the buildings are numbered. Primarily what I'll be talking about tonight are um, the buildings that are numbered number one, two, three, four. Number one is the existing um, maintenance garage. Don, if you, next. This is currently where all the administrative functions and the crews meet. That's their locker rooms, their break rooms, and the vehicle repair garages. Um, as you can see, the uh, facilities are fairly worn and they do not currently comply with code. And one of the new um, regulations that's being implemented, and I've, we have, are working on other DPWs across the Commonwealth, is that um, there's been a new regulation that DPW is now governed by OSHA. And as a result, there's OSHA assessments being performed on many of these DPW facilities, and they're beginning uh, a list of things that have to be corrected. I encourage you to go down between now and the vote, uh, should this pass tonight, to see the DPW facilities. Like I said, um, Tom and his crews have been doing yeoman's work in um, less than you know, ideal situation and conditions. And one of the biggest concerns down there is the ventilation system. The current ventilation system does not work. So when you're in the facility, you constantly are smelling the uh, gas and oil fumes as well as the exhaust from the vehicles. Next, please. This is the other structure that will be uh, demolished and removed. This is a, currently the vehicle um, storage facility. As you can see, Tom and his crews have scabbed together um, construction materials from, across, from other projects and stuff to construct this. Um, currently, there's probably about a million to a million five worth of equipment that is being stored in that facility. But as you can see, it's not really weather tight. The birds fly in and out. Um, there's no heat, there's no paving, and um, that's where we're storing a lot of this equipment that is used to um, support the town. Next. 
Again, this is another um, one of the vehicle storage um, facilities there. We call it the chicken coop. Um, as you can see, it's well ventilated. Um, needs a little bit of a paint job. Um, but one of the things that the, uh, which I found out working with Tom on this, is a lot of this equipment in here is like secondhand or salvaged equipment because, for example, you might see in there one of the street sweepers. Well, a typical street sweeper may only have a three to five year life expectancy. But what the DPW does is they pick up some of the old ones that are being discarded by other towns and stuff. They scab parts off of them to keep our current equipment running. So it, uh, the DPW is getting anywhere from five to eight years out of a piece of equipment rather than having to go out and buy new equipment. So that's what this, um, again, what we refer to as the chicken coop supports operations like that. Next slide. Uh, this is another one, the uh, stellar storage facilities that they have. As you can see, it's just old scrap materials that were put together. This would be for like materials like asphalt and stuff to keep them dry. So when you need the emergency patch and materials, they're available. Next. Uh, this is the existing, uh, one of the existing um, salt storage shed. Um, ideally, this would, we'd like to replace this, but due to the budgets and everything, this is in relatively sound condition. So this would just get, um, routine maintenance that would be done under another contract, primarily just painting. It works currently, it's adequate for the needs, so we've decided not to remove this facility. Next. This is the newer salt storage. Um, there are no deficiencies or anything on that this has been maintained. I think this is about four years old, you know. So this is in great shape. There's no reason why with proper maintenance, this facility shouldn't get another, you know, 15 to 20 years life expectancy. Next. This is a relatively easy thing to replace. Um, simply, um, Tom and his crews will be relocating these blocks. And again, this is just for storage material like gravel. Um, if you go back there, you'll see the crushed gla glass and everything that they use for processing and things like that. Um, it's just a matter of moving the blocks and other locations on the site to accommodate the new construction. Next. And then this is the uh, fueling station that Tom was referring to. Again, it's been recently updated and there's no need to make any changes to this portion of the facility. So this site is currently serviced by um, Municipal Electric on Geld. It is on a well and septic and, and there is no natural gas service there. The paving is in poor to fair condition due to the soil conditions and there's no emergency generator there. One of the other things we'd like to point out is currently none of the facilities are protected by sprinkler systems because there's not adequate water service. So that will be one of the things that we introduce in this new project. So as I said, if you focused on buildings one, two, and you know, three and four, so three and four go away and it's replaced by seven, which are those material storage bins. But primarily what I'd like you to see is um, facility one, which is the existing admin building and vehicle repair garage, will be um, basically gutted and rehabbed. The structure and everything is fine. And we'll be introducing new mechanical systems. And then when I show you this next slide, Stu, for the um, number two, which is the new vehicle storage garage. So as you can see, what we've done is reconfigured the uh, administration areas to include proper lockers um, and facilities for the crews that are working there. There are minimal office requirements, a meeting room, and a break room, which is pretty important because when they are doing the storm emergencies and everything, this is where the guys gather, get refreshed, and go out for another five, ten hours plowing or doing whatever they need to. The other thing, too, is the vehicle repair garage this will be just updated with new ventilation and things. And one of the things that we've had to do is, um, again, this is a new regulation. Well, I shouldn't say new, it's been around for a while. But currently, all vehicles of this nature have to be washed within a wash bay, and they can no longer be washed outside so that you can contain any potential oils or anything that may come off the trucks. And you'll see in the back area, there's a new sprinkler room. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to put 40,000 gallon cisterns in the back of the uh, site that will be used to put out, uh, support the uh, sprinkler systems for both of the new facilities. Next. And then this is just a, again, basic structure. It's essentially a shed that will hold uh, approximately 24 vehicles um, that Tom uses for the various services and the DPW uses. Next. So as you can see, the needs are real, and we encourage you to support this article. Thank you. Mr. Haddad.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm going to go over some of the costs and the impact of approving this article on, on the operating budget. I have a little presentation to show you. So, next slide, Don, please. The, the project budget, the existing building renovations that Greg just pointed out to you, it came in on bid at a cost of $2,763,000. The vehicle storage building was put out as an alternate bid and it came in at $1,642,000. The building committee voted to accept that alternate bid. The construction contingency is 5% or $220,000. Construction administration and OPM, which pays for our project manager and our architect throughout the project, is $195,000. So the total project cost is $4,820,250. The electric light department is assisting in the construction of this building by purchasing a generator. The generator will not only service the two new facilities at the uh, center, at the uh, DPW facility, but it will also help offset some rates during peak periods when they, when they run that generator. So the total Article 7 request is $4,620,250. When the town goes out to bond that amount of money, the annual debt service on the existing building, which is the construction renovations of the main building plus the contingency and contract costs of $2,978,000, we'll, we will bond $209,000 a year in debt service payments. The annual debt service on the vehicle storage building of $1.6 million would be $126,000. So the total project annual debt service over a 20-year period will be approximately $335,000 a year. The impact on the tax rate, if the debt exclusion passes at the May 21st annual election, will be 12 cents on the existing building, with the cost of the average taxpayer, which is a home value at $459,000, of $55.08. The cost of the average taxpayer over 20 years would be $1,102 for that existing building. With regards to the vehicle storage facility, the anticipated increase in the tax rate for that would be seven cents, and an annual cost of the average taxpayer of $32.13 annually. The cost of the average taxpayer over 20 years would be 643. So the entire project cost on the DPW project will be 19 cents on the tax rate. The total annual cost of the average taxpayer will be $87.21. And the total cost over 20 years will be $1,745. Thank you. <coughs> Is there anyone else, Mr. Delaney? OK. Are there any committee reports the chair is not aware of? Seeing none, we'll now open the floor for comments, questions, debates. Please move to your nearest microphone. Yes, down front. Ms. Gilbert. Um, so the part of the project that I'm interested in is the storage facility, the warehouse for the 1.624, I think it was. So um, I understand I built a garage to obviously house my car, gives it longevity. but. What is the cost analysis in regards to how much we're actually going to save in vehicle purchases over the course of the year compared to the cost of that actual building being built? In other words, is there a cost analysis available or can someone explain the amount of money we're saving by storing our vehicles versus the amount of money that we're spending on building the, the facility? That would be one question. My other question in regards to that was we have a capital schedule that calls for X vehicles to be replaced at certain times. Do you have an updated capital schedule presented for us tonight so we can see how this will change that capital and spread out the expenses? Uh, Mr. Yanchenko. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to address the storage versus the vehicle. I do not have specific numbers, but what I will tell you right now is um, there's both the cost for the vehicle that you're saving by protecting it under a garage, but also the operational efficiencies of those vehicles. So for example, if you have equipment that is covered in snow or you know, covered with ice and stuff, it no longer becomes operational. And so you do lose time in maintenance. And this is primarily when uh, the DPW needs the facilities like in inclement weather and stuff. This would also be uh, true for like lawnmowers and stuff. Right now, most of the lawnmowers are sitting out in that back chicken coop shed that we referred to as. And I think any of you that have lawnmowers at home, there's one thing to park it in the garage and keep it dry, 
versus letting it sit out, because it's not necessarily the housings and everything that are associated with that particular lawnmower, but it's all the little integral parts like the levers and the switches and stuff that then um, deteriorate and everything. As far as the capital, I will let Tom, you can address that from the equipment point. Mr. Delaney. I, I don't know if there's any way to even calculate what Marlene is looking for. I can't hear you. I don't think there's a, a real good way to calculate for what Marlene is looking at. You know, the, the vehicles are going to last. Are they going to last longer? They probably are. Is it going to be a calculatable number? I'm not sure. Um, we didn't look at it that way. I'm looking at it as a way, so we're going in, it's zero degrees out, we go in to get in a truck to plow. Number one, it's already going to be warm. When we put it away, it's going to be able to be not in freezing weather. It's going to dry, so it's going to be dried out faster. There's going to be less chance for that, that piece of equipment to rust. Um, you, everybody sees what happens when you leave a vehicle outside. They rust more. You know, our, we've washed our vehicles every time they come back. The wash bay is going to help now. But the biggest thing is you got to get them to dry once, the, once you wash them, especially in the wintertime. This is going to help them a little bit. I, I can't calculate the number, though. Okay. Um, Mr. Press, did you want to address that question? Yes. Um, what I did want to say is that all of you who have vehicles, if you like to work outdoors in the snow to maintain them, I guarantee you'll have huh, a lot of fun. Well, we have our vehicles that have to be inside so that we can maintain them, and that's what the DPW does as well with their vehicles, and the buildings to enclose those vehicles make that maintenance possible year-round. Okay. Ms. Gilbert, you had a quick follow-up. So my question was, is there an analysis? So the answer would be no to that. I just want to clarify, because I understand the concept. I have a garage. I, I get it. But I also understand that we have this as an option. We have a library roof as an option. We have a country club coming up. We have Prescott coming up. We have Floro coming up. As every single debt exclusion gets approved, our taxes come 2023 are going to go through the roof. So I am trying to isolate um, what we absolutely, as a taxpayer, what we absolutely need at the moment compared to what we absolutely would like at the moment. It's absolutely more convenient to get into my car and start it up in a garage. I agree. It's a lot easier. It's more convenient. But I'm looking for simply the actual cost analysis of the savings compared to the actual cost of doing that building over the life of the building. If that's not available, that, that's fine. I, I can vote no without that for that particular portion. I don't know if the uh, motion is going to be a total or in pieces in regard to the project. It's currently moved as a total okay. number. Mr. Amaral. Good evening, John Emerald, Chair of the DPW Building Committee. This isn't. This is certainly not a uh, a want. This is an absolute need. This building dates back to 1989. The DPW workers, Tom and his department, have dedicated just so much of their time, above and beyond what is normally required. They are supporting every department in our community. They are providing for safety on our roads during the storms. If, if this was simply, let's get the latest and the greatest and the be best building to support uh, our DPW, I don't know that many of us would be for it. An analysis of how long the equipment is going to last, well, yes, that would be something uh, perhaps when, you, when you're doing financial budgeting, you know, may be appropriate. This is such a dire need at this point. That building is not in compliance there will be a substantial expenditure required whether or not this, this uh, article is approved. Tom and his team have, again, committed so much of their resources and their expertise to save our other departments money. It's, it's time for this facility to be replaced to provide a safe environment for our DPW employees to work in, which translates to a safer town for us as well. Thank you. In the back, yes, sir. Uh, Chris Colton again. Uh, I actually have a question. I think it's more for the Finance Committee, though. Uh, it, the situation is that this is supposedly only going to move forward if we get a approval for a uh, Proposition 2.5 override. Um, I'd like to understand um, the impact 
and as well as the difference between a non-override and a regular override. If I understand correctly, when we vote an override, the impact to the levy limit is that that stays forever, whether this is a 10-year or otherwise. Um, so if you could explain the differences, not only as far as you know, when we pay, but as long-term impact to the tax for an override versus a non-override type expenditure. Town Manager, Mark Haddad. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. There are a few different types of overrides that, that communities can pass. The general operating override is a permanent increase in the levy limit, and that stays with you forever unless town meeting votes otherwise to, to decrease the budget. With regards to what we're asking for here, this is what is known as a debt exclusion question. The town would go out and bond the $4.6 million. We anticipate the average, the annual debt service cost to be $335,000, which is the 19 cent increase uh, in the tax rate. Once that debt is paid off, the debt goes away and the 335,000 comes off the books and we no longer raise that amount of money every year. Based on our best guess on the average tax bill, we believe this project will cost the average taxpayer $1,700 over the 20 year period. I hope that answers the question. No, I'd like to hear from the Finance Committee as far as, my understanding from the state law is that once a proposition, two and a half override, which is what is being asked, is that that amount, which he did refer to, does stay there. Uh, Mr. Green, from the Finance Committee. Right, so uh, under current law, there's actually two different ways of handling this. One is for operating expenses, which would be classically termed a prop two and a half override, and you're absolutely correct. If we do a prop two and a half override for operating expenses, that stays indefinitely unless we choose to do a prop two and a half underride, which I think has happened twice in the entire history of the state. Um, for capital projects that are debt related, we actually don't do a prop two and a half override and fund it via operating uh, the budget. We actually put it under, under our capital budget and we fund it with what's known as a debt exclusion. So what happens is that um, if we vote to pass this here, uh, we also have to vote for the debt exclusion on the ballot at the at the annual town meeting. No, sir, it, at the ballot, at, at the, the election. Ballot. What yeah. did I say? Annual town meeting. Excuse me, at the ballot. Um, if it passes at the ballot as a debt exclusion, what that means is it doesn't come within the Prop 2.5 levy uh, limit. It's actually set aside outside of that, so it doesn't impact... Uh, our normal operating budget. And um, the debt exclusion that we would pass would be for a 20-year debt exclusion, and at the end of the 20 years, this, this would come off at that point. Okay, thank you. And if we didn't, if we just tried to fund it under regular, without the two and a half override? Uh, we, we uh, you know, per all the earlier conversation in the evening, uh, we, you know, we, we probably wouldn't do the project because it would be very difficult to afford within our current operating budget. Thank you. Ms. Manugan. The town manager is saying we could not afford it in the current operating budget. To be clear, we didn't, we didn't look at that. It was always assumed we would do a debt exclusion for this project. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. So I just want to clarify for folks that I am the member of the select board that isn't able to support this project. Um, this originally came up a couple years ago and it was talked about in the ballpark of $100,000 or so to, to make some repairs. Um, it then showed up on a capital plan for $2 million, and now we're being asked for $4 million plus. Um, and I'm not gonna debate the merits or the need for the building, but in terms of our ability to plan, um, as Ms. Gilbert highlighted, there are a number of needs we have as a community, and I don't think that our municipal leadership, myself included, have had an opportunity yet to identify what things are needs, what things are wants, and we don't understand yet how approving this will impact other priorities down the line. Yes, sir, down front. <clears throat> yes, Rob Foley. Um, I'd actually like to follow that because I'll tell you the truth, I looked at that article and I thought, oh geez, 4.6 million. We're just gonna keep spending. But I wanna compliment you for pulling a lot of things together and basically working, it seems like, on a, on a shoestring. Um, 
And what I'd ask the Finance Committee and the Select Board to do is to actually provide us in the public with what the must-haves and the nice-to-haves are. It would really help us to be able to prioritize how we can vote. Could we do that? Could you do that? I hear you, Ms. Manugi, and that you, you haven't had a chance to do that, but what's, what's precluding us from doing that? What's precluding us from co creating a list of, look, we've got buildings that aren't up to code that have to be paid for versus something else that's adding to additional or incremental services? Why can't we do that? Chair would recognize anyone who wishes to respond, Mr. Geiger. Uh, I am a member of the building committee that has overseen and guided the work of this from inception to where it is today. And I got to tell you, if, if there's something in there that isn't a need, I don't know what it is. We have looked at this thing 40 ways from Sunday, trying to make sure that we weren't attempting to accomplish anything that was a nice to do thing. So I hope that helps. I, I just don't want people feeling that it hasn't been uh, very carefully watched by this independent committee over, over its creation um, with, the, with the sincere attempt at not asking you to pay for anything that we don't need to have a safe, effective, and financially uh, reasonable uh, facility out there uh, for our workers, for our equipment, and to service you, the members of the town. Okay, uh, Mr. Delaney. Uh, just a quick, another little quick update on the whole thing. So the, the main part of the garage, rehabbing just that garage alone without doing anything else, we will lose space. Right now, we don't have enough space. There's been a lot of talk about the storage garage. Our existing, if anybody wasn't able to come down to the big to facility, anytime you want to, if, we, if this passes here tonight, we'll have another open house before the, the, uh, before the vote. It's basically made out of two pieces. One piece is some, for some of the old highway garage from Willowdale Road, and made out of beams from the Pleasant Street Bridge when we took down the rail trail, when they put the rail trail in. And the other building is one that the highway department took down from over in West Groton and brought down there and put up. The roof, roof leaks. It was kind of comical the other day during the rain when we had the last open house watching the birds fly through the windows of the vehicles that had the windows open. So that's, that's an idea of you get a picture of what the, the warehouse building is going to replace. That, that price was already cut down $600,000 from the original bid because it was supposed to be a different configuration with the mezzanine above it so we could store stuff up above, cones, barrels, that kind of miscellaneous uh, equipment. We already took that piece out because that $600,000 would have put us way above numbers where we are now. In the back, yes, sir. I'm Jeff Wallens from Lowell Road. I did go to the open house, and my understanding was that a lot of this work is driven by OSHA. OSHA is not optional. Uh, so we're going to have to fund this work somehow. How much of this expense is OSHA related? Is it basically all OSHA related or just some of it? Uh, Mr. Yan Jenkin. It's, it's hard to exactly say what OSHA's requirements. For example, the building skin, okay? Currently, it is not a building, it's not an efficient building from a building envelope standpoint. So we're reskinning it and making sure the roof and everything doesn't leak, okay? That only becomes an OSHA problem if the roof is leaking and we start getting ice on si inside the equipment bays and everything. And, uh, the workers start to slip on it. So I, I can't say, for, for example, that replacing the building envelope is an OSHA requirement. However, I do know the requirements for safety rails in the grate where there is a pit there, that is an OSHA requirement. The ventilation requirements are OSHA driven and stuff. And so it, I can't say that 50% of the project is OSHA driven. I can't say you know 100% of the project is over. But there is a combination and a mix, and it's just depending on which particular item that you're looking at becomes a problem. For example, like the electrical system, it's not up to grade. So you know you plug in a receptacle, um, you plug in a power cord or something, it shorts and stuff. Now it becomes an OSHA requirement. So that's why I'm trying to say, I mean. 
if you told me and you had, you know, forced me to say, I'd say 50% of the cost is being driven by OSHA and bringing you just up to code. The other 50% is associated with those systems like the building envelopes and stuff that have to be addressed. And then others are just strictly building code requirements because under the new seismic uh, code, under the ninth edition, things had to be upgraded as well. So it's kind of a combination of everything and, um, you know, there's no specific numbers that we could break out for OSHA versus other things. In the back, yes, Mr. Eason. Uh, Bruce Eason, Martins Pond Road. I've taken the tour over there. The, I would say the place looks like a Hooverville from the 1930s depression. <laughs> Tom's done a hell of a job of keeping together. Uh, he deserves our respect. <laughs> I wish I could say there was a better time to do this in terms of other financial liabilities of the town, but I think it's time that we step up and help Tom help us. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Deegan. It's a little bit difficult to address Marlena's question, but being someone who uh, outside in the cold in the middle of the winter because I don't have a garage and my trucks stay outside and after they plow snow they're covered with salt and then you wash them and then they freeze and then the tires don't move and then you got to get under there with a torch and you have to do all types of things you have all kinds of maintenance issues all kinds of expenses that occur once you get to springtime from storing equipment out in the cold and you don't see the cumulative damage that occurs but I know it firsthand that if a truck is garaged in a controlled environment and it's kept clean, its longevity is easily 25, 30% longer. I mean, have we got the metrics to prove that? No. I've got 35 years of experience showing how much money I've thrown away by keeping my trucks outside. So, while the first portion of the building uh, to retrofit, upgrade, and building appliances uh, employees, that's something that has to be done. And while, yeah, it was 100000 and then it was 200000 or $300 band-aid put on the building, that building needs way more than a Band-Aid. It needs exactly what's being proposed. So you look at the aggregate, and you look at the two separate facilities. You can decide, and you can amend this down and, and go for one. But the bottom line is, at some point, you are going to do uh, yourself and the town a favor by saving money on moving forward with this and making the employees uh, or giving the employees the safety that they really deserve. So I hope you all support this. Thank you. Mr. Lathrop, it's your first turn at the microphone. <laughs> yeah, Olin Lathrop, Sunset Road. I move the question. The motion has been made to move the question. Is there a second? A motion to move the question has been made and seconded. If you vote in favor of moving the question, we'll move directly to voting under the main motion under Article 7. If you, move, if you vote against moving the question, debate will continue. Because it suppresses debate, a motion to move the question requires a two-thirds majority. All those in favor of moving the question signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. The motion to move the question passes by a unanimous vote. Article, the main motion under Article 7 requires a two-thirds majority. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Aye. The ayes have it. Motion seven, or Article 7 passes by a two-thirds majority. Are there seven voters who wish to chair the ruling Ruling of the wish to challenge the ruling of the chair. Not seeing any. We will move on. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now 10 of 10. You've done excellent work. The chair would now accept a motion to adjourn to next Monday evening at 7 p.m. here in the pack. It has been moved and seconded to adjourn to Monday, May 6 at 7 p.m. here in the pack. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, this meeting is adjourned until next Monday, May 6th at 7 p.m.